Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are watching this from. And welcome back to the Schiller Institute Conference, World at a Crossroads, two months into the Biden administration. Uh, I'm Diane Sayre, and I'll be moderating this panel today, which has many distinguished speakers. The title of this panel is Southwest Asia Crossroads, Pivot for War or Peaceful Development with the New Silk Road. Uh, on this panel today, and I'll introduce everybody actually immediately before they speak, but we will have the Foreign Affairs Minister of Yemen, we'll have a member of the uh, Parliament of Iraq, uh, Jacques Cheminade, the leader of Solidarité et Progrès in France, and I think Helga Zepp LaRouche will also be joining us for the Q and A. Um, so, and we welcome your questions, and I would appreciate uh, sending them to questions at SchillerInstitute.org as they come to mind. Uh, as I participated in yesterday's first two panels. I must say the panel on culture was extremely uh, powerful and I think urgent watching for people all over the world. The second panel yesterday I think is critical for the American people. We should get every American to watch it because as you hear the speakers from Russia, China, Syria, Pakistan, and Ibero-America, uh, Argentina, Mexico, etc., it becomes very clear and unavoidable that of the 8 billion or so people on the planet, uh, seven and a half billion or more are not Americans, and they don't live in the United States, and they have a certain view of the United States, uh, differing, of course, uh, from country to country or region to region. But I think Americans would do well to take a lesson from Robbie Burns and uh, consider to see ourselves as others see us. Uh, and that panel, I think, would go a long way in helping with that. And I think today's panel also um, is going to have a similar effect um, it will put in bold relief some of the problems inside the United States that we may not often consider but are painfully obvious to the rest of the world, and we will have to develop the courage to face them squarely as Franklin Roosevelt uh, did and as Lyndon LaRouche always did. So without saying more, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker today, who is a friend of mine who has really taken up the challenge that Lyndon LaRouche gave all of us, which is to be a patriot of your nation, your homeland, but to be a citizen of the world and to act for the good of humanity. And what you find is that these things are not contradictory. He's translated the World Land Bridge Report into Arabic, co-authored our the EIR report on the uh, development of Africa and Southwest Asia, and has become very well known in Iraq as a both a teacher of LaRouche's economics and an advocate for the World Sil Silk Road. So I'd like to introduce now Hussein Askari. Thank you, Diane, for this uh, nice uh, introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to address uh, keynote this uh, panel, especially after the fantastic uh, two panels uh, which we saw yesterday. First of all, I would like to wish all of you a happy new year, a happy no ruse. Yesterday, Saturday, we witnessed the vernal equinox as the sun positioned itself directly on the Earth's equator, shining equally on the North and South Poles of our planet and on every nation, uh, declaring the arrival of the spring. Many nations in Asia celebrate this as the first day of the new year. All nations, are equal in the eyes of the universe and the creator of the universe. Now, when we look at the world from space and specifically at the confluence of the continents of Eurasia and Africa, we take note of a region which is falsely called the Middle East. So you have in the first slide, uh, this map is something which the Schiller Institute and Lyndon and Helga Zepp and their associates have developed of the 
what, what we call the world land bridge is connecting all the continents and nations with development corridors. And on, we imposed on it the Belt and Road Initiative corridors, which were announced by the Chinese president Xi Jinping in 2013. Now, the problem is that people are too much possessed by the idea of trade. The Silk Road is not simply for trade, it's a development corridor. And I hope all of you saw the wonderful uh, clip of the speech made by Mr. Lyndon LaRouche many, many years ago about the idea of the development corridors. So when we talk about these, and we draw these lines, these are development corridors as we will come to discuss. Now, there is no such a place as the Middle East. East of what and in the, in, in the middle of what? Uh, in the United Nations, or if you are a soccer enthusiast, you know that there is not no FIFA football division called Middle East. Now, this Middle East is a creation, the term is a creation of the British East India Company, which coined the term to identify its colonies and properties as seen from London. So you have the Near East, the Middle East, and the Far East. That is far from London. We, the, Uni we, the United Nations and FIFA, don't use British colonial terminology. We use scientific criteria for looking at distinguishable con continents, landmass. So we have East Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, and our region, West Asia not Middle East. For reasons of including Afghanistan and even Pakistan, we say Southwest Asia. The same thing uh, applies to the term Indo-Pacific, which is a geopolitical concoction. There is no such a place as Indo-Pacific. And British geopolitics uh, is making the Pacific, which means calm and peaceful, more and more troubled and warlike. Now, geopolitics have turned Southwest Asia into middle of hell. Look at the conditions in Libya and Iraq and the, con the continuing crimes against humanity that are being committed against the people of Yemen and Syria by denying them food and medicine and by destroying their infrastructure. We should also not forget the plight of the Palestinian people in the West Bank and Gaza who are suffering under Israeli occupation and who don't know if they ever will have a state or a homeland. But our purpose here is not to seek retribution, but to seek justice for the victims of the endless wars. And we do that by building a beautiful future for the children today and for the coming generations. That's our definition of justice, honoring the victims by giving their offspring a prosperous and peaceful future. But work can and should start now, not in the future. So we go to Southwest Asia and its immediate neighborhood. We are looking at a region of almost half a billion people, mostly young people under the age of 23, relatively well-educated. This is also the center of many ancient civilizations, Mesopotamia, Persia, Syria, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Yemen. It is the birthplace of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It also happens to have two thirds of the known hydrocarbon reserves of the world. But most importantly, besides the young population in this crossroads of continents, uh, that's the real wealth of these nations. The term crossroads of the continents was, was used by the late American statesman and economist and our teacher, Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, in a speech he gave in Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates, in May 2002. We can have the next slide. In that speech, uh, which was well attended by oil ministers and half of the cabinet of the United Arab Emirates, LaRouche identified three aspects of the necessary, that are necessary for achieving peace and development in this region. These three are, one, developing the water resources of, uh, and combating desertification, two, industrialization in the sense of using petroleum not as a cash generating export commodity, but as an industrial feedstock for petrochemical and plastics production, increasing the added value and usefulness of each barrel of oil by orders of magnitude. And three, instead of using oil and gas as fuel, LaRouche proposed uh, that these nations build nuclear power, both to desalinate seawater and provide power to its industrial base. 
Five years later, the government of Abu Dhabi launched its nuclear program and the construction of the largest nuclear power plant cluster in the region at Al Baraka site. The second of its four plants was just commissioned for operation last month. Each of the plants generate 1,250 megawatts of electricity and additional heat. But much more is needed in this region as well, as we will see. Now, LaRouche's initiative in this region did not start in 2002, but as early as 1975, when he visited Baghdad, my own birthplace, but I was seven years old then, I didn't know LaRouche. Uh, at that time, he proposed the Oasis Plan for achieving peace between the Arab nations and Israel on the basis of economic development, not more political paperwork agreements. Uh, again, in 1993, when the Oslo Agreement was signed between the Palestinians and Israelis, Mr. LaRouche said, get the shovels and bulldozers in the ground immediately and start building the economy, economic infrastructure necessary for the people. Otherwise, extremists lurking in the background, like Ariel Sharon and others on the Palestinian side, would do their best to sabotage the peace process by provoking violent actions. Unfortunately, they succeeded because the US, Europe, and the Israelis got busy making real estate deals rather than developing the economy of the whole region, as Mr. LaRouche advised. By real estate deals, I mean long negotiations about which piece of land I get and which piece you get, et cetera, et cetera. Following 9-11 attacks in 2001, which by the way, Mr. LaRouche warned it in advance could happen to launch a police state in the United States and globally, the US and NATO went on a rampage in this region, starting with Afghanistan. Iraq followed in 2003, and then we had the so-called Arab Spring, which was used as a springboard for invading more nations like Libya and Syria in 2011, and launching the war in Yemen in March 2015. By the way, this week is the anniversaries of the invasion of Iraq, the, the war on Syria and the war on Yemen all started in, in March. While campaigning to stop these destructive wars, Mr. LaRouche and our association presented alternative policies for the US, the EU, and these nations based on the understanding of the realities of this region, our knowledge of physical economics, and the importance of this region for the world. As you may know, Mr. and Mrs. LaRouche and our association were developing since the early 1990s the concept of the transcontinental development corridors or land bridges, as I mentioned earlier which evolved into the Eurasian African land bridge, as also popularly known as the New Silk Road. The Chinese government early on realized this, uh, uh, that this is the right future strategy. And by 2013, President Xi Jinping launched the Belt and Road Initiative, which now has become endorsed by more than 136 nations and more, more organizations and has already transformed the world economy despite massive opposition by the U.S. and some of its allies. So we started matching LaRouche's physical economics concepts with the Belt and Road Initiative as a strategy for reconstruction in this region, this war-torn region, and for lasting peace. In 2014, we developed Operation Phoenix for the reconstruction of Syria and connecting to the new Silk Road. My colleague, Ulf Sanmark, took the risk uh, personal risks of traveling to Syria in the middle of the hot phase of the war in late 2015 and in later years to present this plan to the Syrian leadership. It was in that context that we met with our last session speaker, Her Excellency Dr. Buteyna Shaban, political and media advisor to the Syrian presidency. Operation Phoenix, uh, as we see in the map, uh, this is part of a map which we picked from a documentary we did on Aleppo and the reconstruction of Syria, the rebuilding of Syrian cities within the context of connecting it to the new Silk Road by land and sea and realizing the strategy of the five seas, which was proposed by President Bashar al-Assad before the war. As you can see, the region is, is, is um, surrounded by five seas. Syria before the war was, was self-sufficient in food supplies, medicine, and many other important products. But most of that has been destroyed by the war. Another important aspect of Operation Phoenix is our proposal for the establishment of a National Reconstruction and Development Bank or fund. Ironically, the model we used 
is the idea of creation of national credit as developed by Alexander Hamilton, the United States' first Treasury Secretary and one of the founding fathers of the American Republic. A sovereign nation must have the capability to autonomously issue credit for, interna for internal improvements. At the same time, it can reach agreements with other sovereign nations for long-term, long in low interest rates uh, credits for imports of technologies and know-how from these same nations. This was, for example, the way the US assisted Germany in the post-World War II reconstruction period. We move now to Yemen. In 2015, the war against Yemen was waged by the so-called Saudi coalition. What is happening in Yemen is not a civil war, but a foreign invasion backed by the United States and Britain. But even in the darkest moments of this war, we had Yemenis, especially youth, reaching out to the LaRouche movement for support against the war, but also for ideas to organize the people around a concept for peace and development. They are called the BRICS Youth Parliament. Uh, they started teaching LaRouche's economics, uh, economics ideas in their circles. You see in this emblem, there are five uh, figures in the center of it, which they call LaRouche's five uh, keys of development. Actually, we don't have time to go through it now. Uh, they also worked uh, 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 together with the, uh, with the Yemeni Investment Authority and us. We put together a plan for the reconstruction of Yemen and connecting it to the Belt and Road. We called it Operation Felix, the happy miracle of the reconstruction of Yemen. Yemen, for the ancient Greeks and Romans, they were calling it uh, uh, Arabia Felix, which means it, because it was uh, its people were the most prosperous and happy people. Uh, we applied the concept of the development corridor as developed by Lyndon LaRouche, uh, which I mentioned earlier, uh, to the demographic, climatic, and natural resources distribution in Yemen. Then we matched that with the Belt and Road Initiative to make Yemen uh, and South Arabia, South Arabian Rim, a bridge between Asia and Africa. The development of Yemen's ports is also part of the Maritime Silk Road strategy. Operation Felix was endorsed uh, by the Yemeni Investment Authority officially in a special event convened in its headquarters in June 2018. And our friend uh, in this image, uh, Fuad al Ghafari, he uh, presented the plan there because I wasn't able to be in Yemen at the time. So uh, whenever peace is reached in Yemen, the reconstruction of the country can hit the ground running since a complete plan is already available. Here too, we proposed the establishment of a National Reconstruction and Development Bank for Yemen. And I think our guest speakers from uh, Yemen, His Excellency Engineer Hisham Sharaf, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, will address this issue in, this state, in his statement next in this conference. Now we go further to Iraq. In 2020, I was pulled by a group of Iraqi young people into a heated debate in Iraq about, the, uh, about two issues. The first, the government delaying of the building of a strategic uh, great port of Fao in the southern city of Basra in the Gulf, on the Gulf. And two, the blocking by the same government of a very important cooperation agreement with China called Framework of Cooperation on Export and Credits, popularly known in Iraq as the China-Iraq Oil for Reconstruction Agreement. This was a very important credit arrangement reached in May 2018 between the Iraqi Finance Ministry and the Chinese Export and Credit Insurance Corporation, Sinosure, to create a special fund where oil revenues from the, a fraction of Chinese purchases of Iraqi oil are accumulated monthly. These would be matched by a ratio of one to six by Chinese bank loans. The $10 billion fund will then be used to generate loans for infrastructure projects in Iraq to be built by Chinese companies. These projects include ports, airports, road, railways, power projects, housing, hospitals, water, and sewage systems. It means a complete overhaul and reconstruction of the Iraqi infrastructure, which has been destroyed by the wars launched by the US and, British, and Britain since 1991. The neglect of this infrastructure under the U.S.-British controlled government since the invasion of 2003 has left Iraq, one of the wealthiest countries in the 1970s and 80s, 
with a, a daily electricity supply, for example, of only four to five hours a day for households and businesses after 17 years. The same goes for water, healthcare, education, and other services. But this agreement with China uh, was, uh, was not activated immediately when Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi finally activated it in October 2019. Then he suddenly faced a, a color revolution, which had originally started as legitimate protests against the lack of services and the rampant corruption. But it was hijacked by forces that turned it into a violent revolt. When the United States assassinated Iranian Major General Qasem Soleimani and the leader of the Iraqi Popular Mobilization Forces in Baghdad on January 3, 2020, more chaos ensued, and that was the final nail in the coffin of Adel Abdel Mahdi's government, which was forced to resign as consequently the paralyzing of the China-Iraq agreement. Just one thing to say about Qasem Soleimani and this Iraqi Shia, Shia militia leader. These were not fighting the United States. These were busy fighting ISIS, the Islamic State, side by side with the United States. So uh, in any case, the new government, which came as a compromised, uh, as compromised temporary, temporary substitute, suspended the agreement and used the funds uh, uh, the funds for reconstruction to solve government budget problems. I'm not going to say more about the agreement itself because our guest from the Iraqi parliament would like to say something about it today. I have written extensively about it in our publication, Executive Intelligence Review. It was in this context that the youth movement emerged in late 2020, demanding the, the activation of the agreement. I used my knowledge of LaRouche's physical economics previous reconstruction studies and our historical development of the new Silk Road concept to give classes to those youth through social media. These groups started to grow in numbers and gradually the Iraqi opposition media took note of this. Even members of parliament became aware of this movement and its demands. If we look at Iraq in the context of the Belt and Road, we can see that it can be a real bridge between uh, for both the maritime and land-based Silk Roads and utilize its pivotal geographic location in addition to its human and natural resources. If the infrastructure is developed, that would be possible. That development will be possible. In addition, Iraq will be able to rebuild its industrial and agricultural production capacity to free itself from the current total reliance on oil revenues. Iraq sells oil and imports 97% of all its needs. Oil fluctuations have had devastating impact on Iraq, on Iraq economically and socially in, re in recent years. Besides, Iraq can be a large petrochemicals industry using its, its own uh, oil. I would like to show you some of the activities of these young people and the forces they have mobilized in Iraq. We have a few pictures, uh, you know, so you can see they spontaneously have been organizing small demonstrations. Uh, they write posters. This is a picture of in Basra in Iraq in front of the statue of the Iraqi poet Badr Shakr Sayyab, a symbol in Iraq, and also on the highways. Uh, we had, and now I didn't do any of that. These people themselves make these posters and they are posting them uh, everywhere they can reach. Uh, the, I don't know if we have the other slides quickly. These are some of the things they have produced and, you know, uh, putting them on. These are Iraqi tribes in, in Nasiriya who were mobilized also to, their signs say, you know, we want to activate the, the, uh, the China agreement and, uh, uh, work with China on the new Silk Road. Uh, so the, these uh, pictures, some of the, them I got uh, uh, personally, but also they are posted on Facebook page. I would like to stop uh, at this uh, at this picture. I mean, you take a look at these young people. They are probably somewhere between 14 and 17 years of age. These are from a city in southern Iraq where the living conditions are the worst in the country. 
what are they asking for is in these posters is that they want they say we want to activate the iraq china agreement we want to join the belt and road and also we want to build the file project now these kids can become engineers scientists or construction workers if we start the reconstruction process otherwise they might potentially be recruited to some militia or extremist group these are the choices they are facing and you can see what their preferences are, what they want to have, what kind of future they want to have. These are the issues we should be discussing. What, can, what kind of, uh, of choice we want to give them and other youth around the world, which this conference is dedicated to. Many major political forces and parties in Iraq, especially in the South, are now publicly calling for the activation of the China agreement and joining the new Silk Road. Some of them do that out of opportunism uh, since the October elections are approaching. But what, is, what it, this shows is that, these, uh, there, that there is a groundswell uh, in the population around this question. In conclusion, I would just say to especially policymakers in the United States, Britain and other NATO countries, that it is never too late to mend your ways and do the right thing. Therefore, it is the right time that this region, which has been a cockpit of global geopolitics, can suddenly become, where, uh, become a place where the major powers, the US, Russia, and China could work together. One more thing, the people of Iraq, Iran, Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, and Yemen are not out to get retribution or vengeance for what was done to them. They are asking for peace and for having the right for a decent living standard. But believe me, they will keep fighting the invaders of their countries to the last man, which is really unnecessary. If you think you can starve them into submission and force them to give up their sovereignty, independence, and their dignity, you are mistaken. You have not learned anything, and you know nothing about history. But if you do, as Mr. LaRouche repeatedly said, pull out the bombers, drones, and tanks, and bring in the tractors, technology, and engineers, then the people of Southwest Asia will welcome you with open arms. That is what justice means for me and for them. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Hussein. And we'll have a more chance to discuss this in the Q&A. So as you said, we will now be hearing from the Honorable Hisham Sharaf, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Yemen. I would just like to personally uh, say something about the inspiring courage of these people who have been under a constant bombing campaign from Saudi Arabia, uh, supported with weapons from the US and uh, British aerospace, I'm sure, uh, and who are facing mass starvation. So I appreciate very much uh, that uh, the foreign minister took the time to prepare these comments for our conference. It's a good opportunity uh, that we send our uh, best regards to uh, our good friend uh, Helga Laroche, uh, the head of the Scheller International Institute. Uh, at the same time, it is also my pleasure from Sana uh, to welcome all the participants of the World at a crossroad conference, which is now uh, ongoing. And it will be my pleasure also to participate through those days in your conference, uh, which comes, by the way, close to the anniversary, to the sixth anniversary of the aggression against our country on the 26th of March. 2015 and I would like to recall that on that day we thought that this aggression will be over as soon as they realized the Saudis and the Emiratis 
and all of those who join them as they will realize that the people of Yemen does not really obey such kind of an aggression or try to yield. Nowadays, you will hear a lot about Marib. What is happening in Marib? It is a land of Yemen. It is our land where we have our gas and where we can have our oil. And it's our right to have our influence and our control on our land. We are not crossing any other lands and we are free to move in any of our lands borders. Uh, it goes also to the issue of uh, the things that we are passing through. Corona, the COVID-19. We tried our best to manage uh, handling this issue regardless of the fact that the world did not stand by us. Maybe some countries are trying to help us, but because of the blockade, we cannot really uh, get any help and we are trying our best through some UN assistance to do something for our population. Uh, concerning the issue of the pledging conference for Yemen, we knew that the UN have organized that meeting uh, with some kind of a proposal for 3.7 billion US dollars to try to help in alleviating the miseries of our people, which was caused by the Saudis and their allies. But the reality of the subject is politics. Because of politics, we only got about 1.7 or 1.65 billion dollars. And this is not really enough to do many things, but why not? Let's try to handle what we have in our hands. And we are trying to end this aggression as soon as possible by calling for peace. Yemenis and the national salvation government are calling for peace. We need peace for our people. We don't need it for the conflicting parties. And we are not ready to be proxies of anyone, as sometimes they mention. Yemenis are peace lovers. Yemenis want to live within the international community, build their country, build their people, and try to manage our own problems. So let's hope that we will get out of this aggression. The blockade will be lifted. Sana'a airport will be opened and we will receive as many as we can from our friends in, I mean, all over the world. And when it comes to peace, a lot of talks about peace are nowadays. Uh, the U.S. new administration have uh, delegated an envoy, uh, Timothy Leader King, and we in Yemen, really, we do welcome anyone. We do welcome anyone who is trying to help us to reach peace. But everyone in the world should know, should know we want real peace, sustainable and justified. We will not accept peace on conditions of aggression countries like Saudi Arabia or the Emirates or whatsoever of those people. And we do support uh, the envoy of the UN and we'll try our best to help him and again, we say it, a justified, a just and sustainable peace, not a peace that really confirm to the wishes of the aggressors. No way we will accept it. And we know that really we will prevail. And when it comes to the issue of the reconstruction of Yemen, Yemen at the end of this aggression will be reconstructed. Those who destroyed our towns, those who killed our people will pay the price and they will put the required funds for this and we will try our best that within the uh, Silk Road uh, initiative and activities we will help we will try to get the help of those countries under the umbrella of the Silk Road initiative and Silk Road projects and other activities and we will do our best that we become really uh, a good factor and a successful input for the Silk Road initiative. Last word concerning the youth and the young people of the world, including the uh, Silk Road uh, project. I do encourage everyone really to put their best efforts 
for a successful implementation of the projects of the Sikro. And we in Yemen, when the guns are silent, we will be a good factor, we will have a good input in that project. And my best regards, my best wishes to all of our, all of our friends all over the world and peace for Yemen and peace for the world. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Hisham Sharaf. And now we will hear from another nation which has been under war for 17 years and longer, depending if you go back to 1990. Uh, we will be addressed by the Honorable Haidar Al-Fuadi Al-Atabe, who is a member of the Council of Representatives, that is the Parliament of Iraq, and his speech is entitled The Importance of China-Iraq Cooperation for the Reconstruction of Iraq. I extend to you all our love and appreciation crowned with the most fragrant greetings of peace. Our most sublime prayers are for your success in this conference and thank you for inviting me to speak to you. Greetings to the International Schiller Institute and its chairman, chairwoman, Mrs. Helga Tsev Larouche, for convening this important conference in this very sensitive time, and greetings to all esteemed guests. We would like also to thank the member of the Schiller Institute and administrator of the Arabic Larouche School of Physical Economics, my brother and dear friend, Mr. Hussein. Askari for his intervention in the ongoing debate in Iraq regarding the reconstruction of the country and its economic development. We have indeed benefited much from his interventions and proposals. Today we would like to discuss a number of important matters and problems for which the, from which the structure of the Iraqi state suffers. And among these issues is the condition of the infrastructure in Iraq and the rentier nature of the Iraqi economy. We will also point to the importance of activating the Iraqi-Chinese framework of cooperation, generally known in the media as the Oil for Reconstruction Agreement. There is a whole package of problems that haunt the Iraqi economy and the China agreement has many advantages in dealing with them, advantages for the Iraqi people and their economy. We believe these advantages are many. The China-Iraq agreement can be considered the key to ridding Iraq of many of its suffocating social and economic crises. I would like to deal with some of these today which are six, but we'll discuss only two of them in depth uh, due to the time restrictions. Among the problems Iraq is suffering from are the catastrophic deficit in infrastructure, the huge rate of unemployment, especially among the youth, the chronic budget deficit, and the nature of the oil-dependent Iraqi economy. The agreement can also help get rid of the corruption in the country. It also facilitates connecting Iraq to the new Silk Road project. One of the urgent matters is the catastrophic deficit in infrastructure. Whether, whether the solid one, uh, like ports, airports, roads, railways, power generation, water and housing, or the soft infrastructure, such as healthcare, education, and scientific research. Iraq and China can cooperate to build many projects in more than one sector of infrastructure we mentioned all, all at once. For example, building the Fao Great Port and roads and railways to and from it, building power plants, housing clusters, factories, water projects and sewage systems in more than one spot on the Iraqi map. Therefore, we have to solve the infrastructure problem because it affects the social structure too. And I believe this agreement will help pick Iraq out of these problems in the infrastructure.
The other very important matter today is the massive unemployment rate, especially among the young segments of society, which constitute a major part of the population of Iraq. We believe that unemployment makes those youth a ticking social bomb and a reservoir of recruitment for extremist and perverted groups. A clever and serious Iraqi negotiator should make it a condition of cooperation with China to employ a major ratio of the Iraqi workers and engineers in the projects undertaken by the Chinese companies inside Iraq. We all know that the Chinese worker and engineer today have a relatively high wage and uh, enjoys stability and prosperity in their country and are not eager to work for a lesser wage and in a potentially challenging condition abroad. Therefore, Chinese companies tend today to train the labor force in the host country. Thus, Iraq would be able to find employment for tens of thousands of the youth in these projects. Therefore, we believe that the Iraqi-Chinese agreement a key to find solutions to many big problems because the agreement will build for Iraq and its people the economic platform upon which the Iraqi economy will stand to move the wheels of the industrial as well as agricultural production and even vitalize the tourism sector. Because to get rid of the reliance on the rentier uh, single source of wealth, as we argued earlier, Iraq needs to Iraq needs a new economic structure. This is the problem the Iraqi people are suffering from. And the agreement, we believe, is very important for escaping the debacle in which the sons of our, find, our people find themselves in our beloved country. Finally, I hope that Iraq will become a bridge for peace and cooperation among the regional and international powers, not a wrestling ring where they fight. We call on the United States of America and the other powers to respect the sovereignty and independence of Iraq and endeavor to cooperate with China and other powers to respect the global order and United Nations Charter on the basis of equality among all nations, be they large or small, and respect their sovereignty and independence of policy making, but at the same time work jointly for peace, economic development, and mutual benefits. I thank I thank you for your attention and I wish you your conference all success. By the will of God, we will see this framework of cooperation agreement implemented on the ground so that our people may enjoy the various fruits of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Haidar Al Fuadi Al Atabe from Iraq. Now we are going to hear from uh, Shaquille Ahmed. Ramey, who is the director of the China Center at the Pakistani Sustainable Development Policy Institute on uh, CPEC and more, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and Regional Cooperation for Peace and Stability. And I would like to apologize. Um, due to time reasons, we had to make some cuts in his speech. And the things that were cut are also quite important. Uh, so the a uh, whole address will be available later on the Schiller Institute website, and he happily will be on for the Q&A, where he may take up some of these uh, questions, or you will be able to ask questions of him. But this is an extremely important presentation, because what many people may not be aware of is that many of these great projects actually are ongoing, have been started, are in advanced phases of development, and I think you'll see from what he has to say the potential for the region. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, because we are sitting in the different time zones. I'm Shkila Merame. I'm a political economist, and I work on China, and uh, I am working in Pakistan with a renowned think tank, Sustainable Development Policy Institute. If you have any question on this presentation, you can ask me anytime. So, 
my topic for today is CPAC connectivity and the future prospects. Definitely when we talk about the CPAC, CPAC is not just about the Pakistan. CPAC has been designed to improve the connectivity within the region and beyond the region. I will start by just giving you a few facts and figure about the CPAC. Then I will move towards the connectivity and the future prospects. First of all, what is the CPAC? If we look at the long-term uh, plan of the CPAC, which has been agreed upon between Pakistan and China in 2017, so it talks about the seven area. You can look at that connectivity, energy, industry and industrial parks, agriculture development, tourism, and financial cooperation. So this is a brief, and so if you look at that, so what is CPAC? So CPAC revolves around these seven areas. If we look at the first uh, phase of the CPAC, so people are so people talk about so what Pakistan gained through the through the first phase of CPAC. First of all, Pakistan got the seventy five thousand jobs. When we talk about a seventy five thousand job, is means seventy five thousand family. So that's been a huge number of people has been benefited. Also, Pakistan has uh, under the CPAC it has been committed till twenty twenty two the ten thousand more uh, ten thousand and above megawatt electricity will be produced. It is highly needed. Because if we look at the 2015, uh, the region of Pakistan, it was clearly written due to the electricity shortage, Pakistan was losing four to $5 billion on per annum. If we look at the GDP of Pakistan, it is only uh, 200 plus billion dollars. It was a huge loss. Our, uh, our industry was shifting towards other countries because to the load shedding, Pakistan was not able to say, provide a sustainable electricity to the industry. Then 100 plus SMEs also benefited and infrastructure improved. There is a one important aspect I want to highlight. In 2012, there was a report by National Highway Authority of Pakistan to the Parliament of the Pakistan. It was highlighted that Pakistan needed 1.2 billion US dollar to rehabilitate transportation infrastructure. Just to rehabilitate, it did not mention about the financing required for laying the new infrastructure. That infrastructure was deteriorated because Pakistan was part of the war on terror and Pakistan gave access to the NATO and US and other allies to, move, to use Pakistan for a transportation purpose to bring the logistic, uh, to, to bring all the goods needed or the ammunition and anything needed in Afghanistan. That was the price Pakistan was paying. But unfortunately, our allies did not ready to invest in the Pakistan. If you look at the future uh, gains for the Pakistan, the report has been uh, done by the World Bank. It is uh, they, these are the three reports. According to that report, Pakistan would also be the major beneficiary of BRA through CPAC. For example, there would be an increase in um, our real income by eight percent. If Pakistan introduced the reforms, it would be ten point eight percent. And if we look at the welfare gains, that is very substantial because due to the war on terror because Pakistan was allied to the US and the other European countries and NATO. Pakistan also faced the, uh, the problems due to the war on terror and the welfare gain has gone sharply. So due to the BR and CPAC, there will be a welfare gain. And B CPAC will produce 1 million jobs till 2030. If Pakistan included so other parameters of the BRI, it is expected that the jobs will be 4 million for the Pakistani. Then we again about talk about the trade on the export. It will give a boost of 9.8%. If we talk about a factor of return, it will 10.81%. And the major beneficiary in this would be the unskilled labor in the Pakistan. The construction worker and the other infrastructure work will benefit them in unskilled people. Then we talk about the poverty. Due to the CPAC and the BRI, Pakistan will be able to bring about 1.1 million people out of the extreme poverty. But what would be the real benefit? As I started my talk, so real benefit come when the CPAC will act as hub of connectivity. Because through the, China will also love to connect through the CPAC to the other countries. If you look at the, the, I will show you the two maps very quickly. First, right now, how the China is doing a trade with the world. If we look at that from China move from the Shanghai deep sea port, it crosses all the Southeast Asia, then going to the so some South Asian countries, then going to the Arabian Sea, then other countries, then they reach the different parts of the world. This study has been conducted for the six countries only, including Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Germany, France, and some one or two other countries. So 
that is the route if they want to export from the kashgar or they want to export from other part of the country but if we look at that if they use a cpac route it reduces the tra travel time on one side and second thing it also help china to avoid the strait of malacca because there is a, you can say there are some problems in the recent past and it is expected maybe there's some again problem in the coming future why we need and uh, need a cpac plus for afghanistan if we look at the poverty if we look at unemployment if we look at that food insecurity and acute food insecurity and if we look at that jobs 80% jobs are insecure on the food security if you remember a few days back the general secretary of a un he categorically mentioned due to the covid and uh, the are uh, the crisis and the conflict in afghanistan afghanistan is at the brink of the food crisis and then again we have proposed i have proposed one indicators according to the need of afghanistan it's called afghanistan regional economic integration fund why is there the integration fund because if we look at the afghanistan there are different initiatives are working there for example heart of asia the investment of by european union investment by uh, usa india and uh, iran <coughs> and some other countries also should we to present cpac as a competitor to them no we should present it as a complementary and all other projects or all other initiatives should also present themselves as a complementary so best choice would be to develop a new fund for afghanistan by keeping in mind the requirement of afghanistan that's why i proposed this afghanistan regional economic integration fund that fund should be you can say apolitical there should be no politics or there should be no the games or something like that it should be purely for economic development now we talk about the extra regional this is was afghanistan we talk about so they are uh, simultaneously there are other india uh, there are other corridors also in the practice for example first of all some middle corridor of the turkey turkey is also trying to build its own uh, corridor so which are uh, to reach china and again afghanistan will be part of that and being a part of heart of asia and turkey being active member of heart of asia they can also connect it to there and then half harat iran afghanistan that is a new initiative which happened in the last few day, uh, i think last year in the uh, afghan uh, in uh, december so that is a railway line to connect with iran it is can be connected to the international north south transport corridor if it is connected to international north south corridor uh, transport corridor that will be again a major corridor in the region to these all uh, other uh, you can say uh, this uh, uh, eco countries if it is extended naturally it will have the linkages with the cpac and cpac can provide uh, the better ground on the uh, you can say uh, that, that can be happen in the future because through the eco they can expand it there and nobody can talk about it why it is happening to there and the last corridor bcmi bangladesh china myanmar and indian corridor which is the sixth corridor of uh, uh, bri which china is uh, offer which china has offered to the bangladesh myanmar and india if that is happened that will be really you can say interesting event because then on one side china has bcmi on other side china has the cpac if china was to connect bcm with the cpac to reach to the central asia it will give automatic choice to india to reach central asia through a land route which india is demanding for the last for the long well, for the long time they are demanding it and they are dreaming it right that i can say to to reach the central asia through a, a land route bcmi provide them an excellent opportunity if they want to join the bandwagon it will provide them that opportunity what they are looking and what they are trying to do with the half and herat and the international north uh, corridor uh, transportation corridor they can achieve it through bri and cpac but how we can uh, move forward how to achieve it i see there should be no competition among all these corridors they should work to cooperate cooperate and cooperate cooperation would be the only way to make any of these corridors a successful if they are trying to uh, undermine any other corridor it will undermine all the corridors and if they, if they want to build on it and benefit they need to cooperate 
One thing. Second thing, they cannot they cannot compete with BRI or the CPAC. Reason because it's a big it's a part of the big project of China. So under that CPAC and the BRI, 140 countries already have signed MOU with China. So that means CPAC one way or another way would be linked with other things. But still, I say need the need of the time is a cooperation. All the countries need to cooperate. I have to build the linkages with all these, you, know, you can say, the corridors. And there's a strong hook. Like China, China is also trying to invest in Iran. Iran is offering these alternatives to, to the Khef and Herat to China, India. But Iran is also part of BRI. So automatically, it will also come again under this, uh, you can say the BRI and the CPEC will connect, the, uh, connect them. Last point, a wide pressure of the history. The other very interesting thing is happening in this region. For example, China have a civilization. Turkey have their own civilization. The Ottoman Empire and these all civilization. Iran has its own civilization. So, the, so that civilization is a good point. They have the history of the development, of the evolution of the country. But it should not be like a pressure on the minds so that maybe due to the, that evolution, any country is superior to any other country. They are all equal. They need to work together. They need to avoid the pressure of the history, or you can say the baggage of the history. They need to focus on the future. In this whole scenario, Pakistan is a country which does not have any such baggage of the history. Because we were just created in 1947, so we have a, a very short history, and we are not part of any of these uh, civilizations. So Pakistan get, can be get a good harbinger of these all civilization where they can meet, they can work together, and CPEC provide us an excellent opportunity. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to go to the United States. Uh, former State Senator Richard Black, who also is a uh, veteran of the Vietnam War, where he served in the Marines and then became Judge Advocate General with the Army at the Pentagon, and is extremely knowledgeable about Syria in particular. And what he will be speaking on is the truth about the Syrian crisis. And he will also be with us at the end for questions and answers. Uh, I'm Senator Dick Black, and I'm a retired colonel who served in uniform for 32 years. I love my country. I flew 269 combat missions in Vietnam as a Marine helicopter pilot and uh, crash landed once after machine gun fire cut my flight controls. Afterwards, I made 70 combat patrols as a ground uh, air controller for the 1st Marine Division. I was in intense, fierce combat during almost the entire time, and I was wounded. My radio men were both killed beside me. So with that background, let me say that I'm appalled by the indecency of American aggression towards Syria. Just the other day, Secretary of State Tony Blinken uh, chastised his Chinese guest in Anchorage, Alaska uh, for uh, by saying that he that they failed to respect the rules-based order without which there would be much more violence in the world. But what is the, the rules-based order that we're always touting? Seems that the rules are whatever the United States decides it wants at a given moment. By what right do we seize other nations ships on the high seas. Now the rule says that doing so is an act of war. We're not at war. So the rules go on to say that if you're not at rule, then seizures of ships on the high seas are acts of piracy. Are these not acts of piracy when we seize these ships? What rules allow us to establish naval blockades on Syria, Iran, and Venezuela? Are those not acts of war? What rules-based order says that we can punish Germany for connecting a gas pipeline to Russia? What rules in this rules-based order 
allow us to dictate the trade of sovereign nations. The American march of conquest spans the globe. We've invaded sovereign nations like Serbia, Yemen, and Syria, leaving them all in smoldering ruins. Does the rules-based order not prohibit wars of aggression? Did we not prosecute Nazis at Nuremberg for just such actions? What rules make wars of aggression crimes for Nazis, but not for us? We're told that we're fighting a war on terror, but we're not. We're closely allied with terrorists like Al Qaeda in an endless quest to destroy Arab civilizations throughout the Middle East. Few Americans can even name all of our wars. Serbia, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, Ukraine. None of them attacked us. We attacked all of them. Just look at the case of Syria. Remember what Syria once was? Before the war, Syria had a nicely balanced economy. It produced most of its own industrial goods, produced its fuel and agricultural products, had very little poverty and enjoyed thriving trade, and it was financially responsible. It had enjoyed 40 years of peace with Israel and the constitution drafted under President Assad guarantees equal rights for women. And importantly, it guarantees religious freedom in three different parts of the text. I read it. Syria is a model for other Arab states, especially ones like Saudi Arabia, which have no constitution at all. We call Syria's president a dictator, but in 2014, he was overwhelmingly elected by the people of Syria in a fair and free election. It was very heavily monitored. There were lots of observers, all agreed that it had been a, a true and valid election. So uh, Syria is, is a model of elective democracy, if you want to call it that, uh, for, the, for the Arab world. But the Americans pretend that the election never happened. And yet many Syrians who spent 15 hours in the blazing sun so that they could vote for President Assad were targeted and killed by US-backed rebels. Uh, who fired mortars into their midst and, and killed them. Now, after 10 years of war, I think it's important to recognize after 10 years of war, not a single rebel leader has ever emerged as a popular figure with the West loves the terrorists that the people of Syria despise. You know, we're taught to hate President Assad because he cracked down on rioters in 2011, and they say that he gassed his people. But that's not true, because we decided to attack Syria 10 years before all of that. In 2001, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld ordered the Pentagon to draft plans to overthrow seven countries in the Mideast beginning with Iraq, then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off with Iran. Not one of them had harmed the United States. In 26, or in 2006, the U.S. Embassy in Damascus drew up detailed plans to destabilize and overthrow Syria. Those were widely disseminated to the Pentagon, to various unified commands. They went to NATO. They went widely across the world. The specific plans to destabilize and overthrow Syria, and that was long before any demonstrations had ever occurred in Syria. And uh, yet we claim them as the reason that we oppose President Assad. <clears throat> In March of 2011, 
the United States, UK, and France attacked and overthrew Libya. They brutally executed Colonel Gaddafi. The US then turned over control of a Libyan airfield to the Turks, who used it to transport advanced weapons that had been plundered from Libya and send them eventually to supply the terrorists uh, that were organizing in Syria. In 2011, also during the Arab Spring, the highly secretive Central Intelligence Agency Special Activities Center sent paramilitary teams into the sovereign territory of Syria to identify, train, equip, and lead terrorists to overthrow the Syrian government. In 2013, Barack Obama formalized, formalized this long-standing support for anti-Syrian terrorists by secretly authorizing CIA program Timber Sycamore. Under program Timber Sycamore, the CIA's Special Operations Division trained, armed, and paid thousands of terrorists to fight against Syria. Had those armies totally under our control. And in one case, a, a group in, in Aleppo, we had paid over a thousand of their people salaries, given them arms, given them training. And it wasn't until they kidnapped a small Palestinian boy who was being treated in a hospital. They kidnapped him. They took him to the central square in Aleppo. And in order to terrorize the people into not fleeing Aleppo, which was being cordoned off by Syrian troops, they took him to the center in a pickup truck. They grabbed the little boy by the hair. They took a knife and they slashed his head off. And then they paraded it. They held it up and waved it in front of the crowd as a warning. Don't escape from Aleppo. We paid the salaries of every man who held that boy's head aloft. We gave them their weapons. They gave them, we gave them their truck. We gave them everything that they needed. And it was only after that very gruesome incident that we decided, well, that's an embarrassment. We better not pay them. We have been paying terrorists like this throughout the war. NATO and the United States have maintained an intense propaganda campaign against Syria from the outset. Sarin gas attacks that killed civilians were blamed on President Assad. But not one reporter ever asked why Assad would use gas against children, but not against armies of terrorists bearing down on the capital of Damascus. The reason is obvious. There is no answer for that. And the journalists are smart enough to know that if they ask that question, their career in journalism is finished. Secretary of Defense James Mattis admitted in 2018 that the U.S. had no evidence that Assad had ever used sarin gas. Two courageous Turkish members of parliament were quickly accused of treason after they revealed an indictment, a criminal indictment, that showed how an Al-Qaeda cell had infiltrated 2.2 kilos of sarin gas across the border from Turkey uh, for use in Syria, most likely going to Damascus for the initial attack uh, that was the, the red line attack that almost sent American troops into, into Syria. So why do we attack Syria? Well, there are a number of reasons. Part of it ties in with Israeli foreign policy, but the U.S. also seeks to capture oil and gas routes serving Saudi Arabia to pipeline access. Saudi Arabia has an intense desire to impose harsh Wahhabi Islam on the religiously harmonious Syrians. The Turks uh, cast a greedy eye on the industrial city of Aleppo. Uh, the Turks also 
want to capture the oil and the agricultural produce of the nation uh, that is produced in northern Syria. So there are many people who have these desires, and, uh, uh, and uh, there are many reasons behind the war. Uh, certainly, uh, the uh, American arms dealers profit immensely from the lucrative deals like the 600 BMP-71 anti-tank missiles that the Central Intelligence Agency rushed to Al-Qaeda in 2014 to prepare them to attack across the Turkish border. It was only with those CIA uh, provided anti-tank weapons that the Al-Qaeda terrorists were able to break through the Syrian uh, armor and the Syrian lines and uh, seize the beautiful town of Kassab and behead the Christians who were there and all of the churches and then smash ancient tombstones with, uh, with sledgehammers. Uh, that was done thanks to the CIA. Uh, Al-Qaeda never could have broken the Syrian lines without those anti-tank missiles. Many of these terrorist groups have sworn to behead the Christians and the Alawites and to make sex slaves of their wives and daughters. One jihadist famously drove his American-made Humvee into battle with a naked slave girl slashed lashed to his windshield. And he knew that the Syrian soldiers would hesitate to shoot at his home V as long as there was an innocent girl lashed to the windshield. And then that's why he used it. That's why he, he put this poor girl up there and drove her first into battle as his shield. In 2015, U.S. troops illegally invaded northern Syria and unlawfully seized Syria's oil. We authorized an American oil company to build a refinery for $150 million and to drill for more oil on sovereign Syrian land. Before the war, Syria never needed oil or natural gas because it was self-sufficient. It exported a little bit, but it was not a big uh, oil producing country. But what was important is that it provided all of the fuel, all of the gasoline, all of the heating fuel uh, for the uh, power plants and so forth in, uh, in Syria. But now the legacy of the nation has been stolen by the United States, leaving Syrians to freeze to death in the winter as we steal their fuel. The same region, northern Syria, is the breadbasket of the country. It grew enough wheat to feed the entire nation, to export a little bit, but this too has been stolen. We gave it to the Kurds who are shipping Syrian wheat to Turkish merchants while Syrian peasants starved. To tighten the noose on Syria, Secretary Mike Pompeo bragged about cutting Syria off from sources of currency and blockading oil tankers arriving from Iran. He's right. We've caused immense death, disease, and suffering for poor Syrians. Americans are routinely reminded that we're not getting common people, the leaders. Rubbish. That's a total lie. Sanctions do nothing but attack the innocent, the poor, the helpless. They are the most cruel and barbaric type of warfare that we can wage. We steal food, fuel, and medicine from the poor. We blockade supplies for rebuilding so that Syrian men must fight for a living or starve. If we ended the blockade, they could work rebuilding the country. 
Syrians are tired of war. We've imposed 10 years of war on them. They want to rebuild. The young men, the, the time that, that fighting wars was, was exotic is over. They want to go home. They want to build families. They want to rebuild their homes and their businesses. But the United States blockades all materials necessary for rebuilding so that young Syrian men must fight for a living or starve. As it is, the only work is fighting, which will go on as long as we continue funding it. The world must reject the 10 years against the Syrians, but we've oppressed the Iraqi people for 30 years. We've dropped over a quarter of a million bombs on Iraq. And we bombed them even while we sit in military base camps occupying the country. This madness must stop. I thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you very much, Senator Black. Uh, that is something that I think people in this country need urgently to hear and coming from uh, someone whose loyalty to the United States and patriotism really cannot be questioned. Now we are going to hear from Syria from Dr. Zayed Ayoub Arbash, who is an assistant professor on the Faculty of Economics at Damascus University. Good morning from Syria and my thanks to the Schiller Institute team, especially Madame Odile Mojan for uh, giving me the opportunity to participate in this conference. My intervention concerns the development of the context before and during the war in Syria. In order to conclude with a message of hope. Concerning the context before and during the war on Syria in 2011, in the period between 2000 and 2011, Syrian government wanted to shift economy policy toward Enfitah in English opening. This policy aimed to revive economy and social development in terms of restructuration, expand and reinforce its international and national and regional alliance with the vision of five C Cs to take advantage of Syria's geographic position and place the country as a trade hub at the center of a regional energy and transport network around the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, the Arabian Sea, and the Red Sea. Speed up its partnership negotiation with the EU. Implement the Greater Arab Free Trade Area GAFTA agreement. In fact, the Syrian government set out its five-year plan. Under this plan, strategic projects have been put in place to build the road, ports, and pipeline, etc. Despite the instability in the region, Israeli sabotage of peace process in general, the flow of over 3 million Iraqi refugees to Syria, the wave of U.S. sanctions against Syria, and the international financial crisis of 2008, the Syrian economy have been able to record a growing economic performance. The average GDP growth rate was 5% per year during the period 2000-2010. Strong trade balance with national uh, agricultural export, including production of 4 million tons of wheat and 84 million cultivated olive tree. The guarantee of its energy security and continuous improvement, improvement in the human development index according to the EU, uh, to the UN reports. However, with the trio of embargo, war and successive sanctions, everything had not only vaporized, but also we, we watch a systemic destruction of the country. 
as a human reservoir we witness a regional and, and international player, players and actors who put oil on the fire and then cry over the, the fate of the people spending hundreds of millions and billions of dollars on black flags and making Syria a storehouse of global terrorism with one-way ticket travel for jihadists from Europe and the rest of the world to Syria, accelerating the country economic decline, immigration of best human resources, so millions of refugees in neighboring country and Europe, aggravating instability in the Middle East and the spread of extremism. Presently, more than 85% of the Syrian GDP source says, are under the control of American or Turkish occupation or illegal de facto force. This has paralyzed the Syrian economy and destroyed the Syrian infrastructure and hold up the national resources. What is the next? It is self-evident to say that the economic dynamics are a major component of the war against Syria, targeting its sovereignty. The aim of the American occupant and the proxy state are prolonging the war by financing illegal army groups, depriving the Syrian state of its resources, and to prevent Syria to start a real reconstruction process. Obviously, from geostrategic point of view, the objective is to control the Syrian space as a capital space in the Eastern Mediterranean in a region. How is the out outcome of the war? Until now, instead of seeking a mutual benefit, that means win-win situation, some of regional countries tend to align with the U.S. Western strategy which does nothing but further prolonging regional problems rather than solve them or generate real progress and solution. This becomes all too clear when, we, when on looks beyond the crisis of the day. It is very difficult to predict the course of the current situation. One mechanism is sure it is now time to put forward a real alternative based on common interest between regional and international actors, which would respect regional diversity away from extremism and avoiding wasting another decade of development. From a geoeconomic perspective, the region with more than 6 million consumers, that means Arab countries, EU countries, including Turkey, it is more than sufficient to explain the legitimacy of this proposition. This is not only for moral attitude, but also for economic point of view for all countries in the region with mutual benefit. I would like to end with a positive sentence. Shared development is the only way to bring peace into the Middle East. And a permanent solution can only reach can only be reached through the concept of peace through development, as Schiller Institute stressed. This idea has already put in on an international agenda, especially with recent events in Europe. I mean the uh, different problem with terrorism act in Europe. It is evident that the challenges on the ground are enormous in terms of investment required, rebuilding of infrastructure and housing, infrastructure in terms of soft and hard infrastructure, roads, a bridge, etc., school, education, different sectors. But on the other side, the potential domestic is very higher, and the reconstruction process presents an extraordinary perspective of the opportunity. Consequently, peace through development seems 
to be the best way to avoid another Western decade for Syria and for the majority of Middle, East, Middle Eastern countries in general. Thank you again for the opportunity and for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Abash. And so people know he will be with us for the question and answer period. So if you have questions for this uh, professor, please send them to questions at schillerinstitute.org. We will now go to France to Ambassador Michel Rimbaud, who uh, is the former French ambassador to several nations uh, in Southwest Asia, Africa, and uh, Ibero-America, and he's the former director of the French Office for the Protection of Refugees and Stateless Persons. It was last December. After four years of chaos, Donald Trump had retreated to his White House to terminate a term of office that one wondered if it ever would end. Being in office by the will of the people, Trump seemed determined to get out there only by the force of the bayonets, rather an endless term than an end of the term. He made no secret of his two objectives. First, to ruin the life of his over-democratic opponent, the old Joe Biden, and second, to continue to bleed to death the countries that still dare to resist America, with Syria and its allies being the object of particular relentlessness. In the two-party system imposed by the deep state, of which the madman theory of Nixon Kissinger and the creative chaos of Leo Strauss and Norman Poderetz are the two epistles, it is Zionism that cements the marginal rift between Republican and Democratic thoughts. It was therefore not to be expected that the America First, now replaced by Biden with America leading again, would bring about a notable change in America's relationship with the world, especially the Arab Muslim world, with which it has a difficult relationship as a result of its insane love for Israel. This remains to be checked. At the end of his mandate, Trump had inspired his Republican supporters to have Congress vote on a bill presented by 150 representatives and senators prohibiting any future American government from negotiating with Syria as long as Bashar al-Assad is president, even prohibiting the latter from running in any presidential election. An unprecedented madness. This law having apparently been passed, the main European countries, the United Kingdom, but also France, Germany and Italy, have followed and adopted it with their little finger on the seam of their pants as usual. What was supposed to happen has happened, guided by the Joe Biden-Kamala Harris duo and with the full support of its servile European vassals. The guide of the world continues to bleed the countries that still dare to resist the will of the United States of America. In February 2000, in an article published by the American Enterprise Institute under the title Let's Beat Syria, Don't Leave It Alone, David Wormser, a well-known neoconservative thinker and an advisor to George W. Bush, called for a conflict in which Syria is slowly bled to death. Coming on the heels of the assault on Iraq and nine years of sanctions and embargo, the warning was worth taking being serious. Syria has now in Washington sites, and with the aim of getting rid of the two Baathist regimes, was a symbol of the Arab nationalist movement and so-called relics of the Cold War. In September 2001, 10 days after the terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers, Iraq and Syria were at the top of the American list of seven Arab and Muslim countries to be invaded and destroyed within five years. Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan and Iran. This list was unveiled in 2007 by the former Commander-in-Chief of NATO forces in Yugoslavia, General Wesley Clark. The offensive against Syria was to be launched in May 2003 when Secretary of State Colin Powell, who had just distinguished himself by his famous lie to the UN Security Council, would come to Damascus to deliver to Bashar al-Assad a message in the form of an ultimatum 
and joining him to cut off his relations with Hezbollah, to break his alliance with Iran and to withdraw Syrian troops from Lebanon. The Syrian president's blunt refusal was received as a declaration of war and the American counterattack came on December 2003 with the so-called Syrian Accountability and Lebanese Sovereignty Recovery Act, marking the opening of hostilities, a green light to launch plans against Syria and Lebanon. The dossier was handed over to President Jacques Chirac as a price to pay for France's attitude towards the Second Iraq War. Syrian troops were indeed withdrawn from Lebanon, but the presidential succession in Beirut would not meet American demands, French hopes or Israeli expectations. Then came the assassination of Rafik Hariri, immediately blamed on Damascus. Syria and Lebanon would then remain in Washington's sights. Launched in the heart of winter 2010, the events hastily baptized as the Arab Spring would allow the operation against Syria to be camouflaged as a so-called popular, spontaneous, democratic and peaceful revolution. <clears throat> in mid-March 2011, this war was launched and is now entering its 11th year. Let us be clear that it is not a war for democracy or human rights, nor it is, a, is it a civil war despite the efforts made to embed this idea. The movements of populations has always been one way when both options were open, with displaced people systematically seeking refuge in state-controlled areas, fleeing areas held by the jihadists and their allies. Syria was and is the victim of international aggression, nothing else. This assertion is crucial for the narrative of the war and for the future, when the time has come for reckoning and, hopefully, justice. In any case, it will be necessary to remind the hundred governments that participated and are still participating in this aggression of the seriousness of their criminal enterprise. And we will denounce, first and foremost, the three so-called great powers of, of the West, the permanent members of the Security Council, who claim to speak of international law, and to be its guardians, when in fact they are the first violators. The concept of crime of aggression is identical to that of crime against peace, used by the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals at the end of World War II, this crime being based on the free and conscious, deliberate will to threaten or break peace, as was said in Nuremberg, Quote, launching a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime. The only difference with other war crimes being that it contains within itself all the accumulated evil and all the, of all the others. It is the crime par excellence. In 1946, the International Military tri Tribunals and the General Assembly of the United Nations, in its resolution 95, undertook to codify crimes against the peace and security of mankind, beginning with the crime of aggression. The concept was incorporated into the Rome Treaty establishing the International Criminal Court on July 1998. The crime of aggression or crime against peace is one of the four core violations of international law, along with genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. If the fundamental principles of international law of the UN Charter were strictly respected by the so-called international community, no government would dare to implement such criminal policies. But it must be said that Western-style international law is to the international law what military music is to music, or what military cuisine is to French cuisine. In mid-March 2021, Syria has been at war for 10 years, which is longer than the two world conflicts combined. There is no need to dwell on its disastrous record. At the end of a decade of collective aggression bringing together Westerns and Islamist forces, sponsored by the Muslim Brotherhood and the Wahhabites, large part of Syrian territory are completely devastated, the economy is completely ruined by destruction, looting, theft, attacks, fires and sanctions of all kinds. The toll of victims and human losses is overwhelming. Four to five hundred thousand dead, two million wounded, one million disabled, twelve million refugees or displaced, all of which goes hand in hand with a dramatic brain drain. 
The societal impact is profound and women have paid a heavy price. Victims of the violence, they bear more than ever in a society lacking men, the burden of the difficult daily life, the care of children. But the Syrian state has not been defeated. With the help of Russia, Iran, Hezbollah, the national army and institutions have resisted. The Syrian people as a whole faced the war with exceptional courage. Syria was the first Arab country to weather the revolutionary storm. Bashar al-Assad has played a major role in this resilience. If he had not been the head of state, there would no longer be a Syria, which was the goal of the aggression. Since the outbreak, the war has undergone unforeseen developments. Its nature has changed dramatically as Syria had military victory in sight in 2018, with Trump already cracking down. The USA and its allies, France, the UK, other Europeans, Israel, the sponsors of Islamist forces like Turkey, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Qatar, would not accept the so-called unthinkable victory of Bashar al-Assad, let alone their own unthinkable defeat. In 2016, Robert Mallet, Obama's Middle East advisor, told the journalist, as long as it does not have in its hands strong cards allowing it to impose a suitable solution to its liking, America is ready to wage, and quote, to wage against Syria a war without end, whatever the cost, even if it were to serve the interests of ISIS for some time. This was obvious reference to the leading from behind strategy that Obama used for his proxy wars, proxy wars that allows to start an invisible war without declaring a war. This is what we are witnessing as a result of the illegal sanctions and other coercive measures imposed on Syria since 2011 at an ever-accelerating pace, increasingly harsh under the Trump administration. In addition to the looting, arson and destruction, not to mention the impact of the pandemic, a total blockade and a notorious seizures law have been added to this illegal and genocidal scheme to suffocate the country and starve the Syrian population, subjecting them to what amounts to inhuman collective punishment. UN experts, secret service investigations and official statements affirm that the sanctions and the imposed blockade are not only war crimes but crimes against humanity of a genocidal nature, a crime of aggression. Since the beginning of these Syrian wars in March 2011 with the full support of its rogue friends from Europe or the East, the Obama administration had undertaken to defeat Syria in order to achieve several overall objectives, which are the following. One, a regime change, including removal of Bashar al-Assad. Two, politicide, political genocide, destruction of the Syrian state, its institutions and structures, and if possible, the dismantling of the country. Three, ethnocide, the attempt to destroy the Syrian people, their society, their history, their memory, their rich heritage, their vast intellectual potential, through mass immigration and refugees. Although the regime change and the removal of Bashar failed, this criminal plan was continued by Trump, the American leading from behind, the second wave of the aggression, this invisible, silent and endless war in order to achieve politicide and ethnocide. Given the new geopolitical balance between the Atlantic camp and its allies and the Eurasian bloc led by China and Russia, supporters of the Syrian state <coughs> This second wave is probably doomed to failure, but the nuisance capacity of the declining American empire should not be underestimated. In this March 2011, 2021, sorry, the calendar offers a golden opportunity to all imposters to race in, in Western countries. France is far from being behind. An avalanche of comments, analysis, articles, statements, speeches, radio and TV programs having in common to hammer the disinformation, the false flags, the lies that public opinions have been force-fed for 10 years on an unprecedented scale. The official propaganda does not leave the slightest space for contradiction, the doxa and the omerta being two sides of the same coin. But this omerta, the law of silence, is almost encouraging, confirming that the censored writings or words reflect the truth. How can the intellectuals, politicians and media of the self-appointed so-called great democracies pretend to believe after 10 years that the 
Arab Springs were so-called peaceful, spontaneous and popular movements. Intoxication, manipulation, shameless lying, obviously. However, the countries that dare to pose as so-called friends of the Syrian people have come to pursue a potentially endless war, their strategy being to ignore the Syrian state or to make it an invisible and voiceless state. They carefully avoid any mention, any figure concerning Syria, crossing it out of the maps where it sometimes no longer appears or omitting it from official documents, including the COVID statistics, etc. The news that the media broadcast about Syria are about sanctions, arrests, chemical attacks, terrorism, human rights violation, despite the reports of UN experts, intelligence services, investigators. So goes the politicide. Sooner or later, peace will return to the greater Middle East, given the new balances when they realize that they, were mu that they must end their endless war, the United States will decide to make peace, if only for the sake of Israel's security or interest, and the first priority omnipresent in the Western landscape, including in French and European concerns. Seeing that there is no other solution, they will give their regional allies the green light and recommend their European lackeys to negotiate. In Trump's time, these loyal followers would have said, let's wait and see. They have no choice with Joe Biden and will have to rely on the saying that there is no war in the Middle East without Egypt, but there is no peace without Syria. This is what the past 10 years have made clear. Thus, if there is no military solution, there must be a comprehensive political settlement. It is up to diplomats to take over from the war makers. But after such a catastrophe, so many victims, so much devastation, so many crimes, it would be imprudent and shameful to stop a war in Syria that has never been declared, without rebuilding a new international law accepted by all and without settling the damages by paying compensation. Concessions will be necessary, but what has said was said earlier about Nuremberg and the crimes of aggression will be inescapable in order to rebuild international relations. The United States, but also the European and Eastern accomplices, are heavily responsible for these crimes. Their leaders love to fill their speeches with democratization, international law, peace and security. Behaving like gangsters, they, they take pride in condemning the rogue state, the regime, the massacring dictator in Syria. They are proud of their most heinous acts of their devastation and boast of supporting terrorist groups that do a good job. These self-satisfied characters should be aware of the precariousness of their position. They should never forget that they are and will always be responsible for an international crime par excellence under international law. They will be held accountable. Without a thorough settlement of all outstanding issues, how can we imagine a normalization as if nothing had happened? Thank you. Um, before we go to the final speaker of this panel, uh, I just wanted to point people's attention to an important press release that Helga Zepp LaRouche uh, put out uh, a couple weeks ago entitled, Why LaRouche PAC No Longer Represents the Policies of Lyndon LaRouche. And you can find that release on the Schiller Institute website or the website of the LaRouche organization. So now we will uh, go ahead to Jacques Cheminade, who is the leader of the LaRouche movement in France, who is the founder and president of Solidarité et Progrès, and he is going to give us a call to action, which will then be followed by questions and answers, and will be joined by Mrs. LaRouche. Well, good morning or good evening. It depends where you are. I am very happy to be with you in this challenging moment. We have reached one of these moments of history for where the human capacity to survive is at stake. After having heard our speakers of the preceding three panels, nobody can deny this. It is a moment of tragedy because the main world leaders, at least in our Western world, have lost the commitment to care for others, for the advantage of others, as defined in the 1648 
Treaty of Westphalia, key to establish peace among nations. We ourselves would become tragic, tragic heroes, if we were to concede to the self-destructive dynamics of our societies, caring more for our own, own destiny than for the common good of humanity. What I mean by call of action is therefore not to tell people what to do, which would be preposterous. It is to share with you that we are the main potential force for the world to come, provided we keep continuously committed to the common good, the general welfare for ourselves and our posterity. As members or friends of the Schiller Institute, from multiple geographical and intellectual origins, we act for the coincidence of the opposites, for a constantly renewed higher purpose in a moral, political, economic, and aesthetic sense, to reach a unity from what has inspired our common contributions. We refuse to be Hamlets, selfishly obsessed by a culture of death. We have less excuses today to remain at an academic and existentialist level than our predecessors before World War II. Let's listen to what Leo under an omission. Whatever he said, the proportions these Nazi crimes assumed, it became evident to all who investigated them that they had started from small beginnings. But it is important to realize that the infinitely small hedge in lever from which this entire trend of mind receives its impetus was the attitude towards the non-rehabilitable sick. Let's be frank, we have less excuses than them. Already, Lyndon LaRouche, during the 1980s of the past century, warned us that potentially today's criminal acts were many times worse in impact than those of Adolf Hitler. Some took that as a provocation or a metaphor. But what is happening in the world since then fully confirms that potential. We are not facing small beginnings only. While people are dying from hunger, as it was said, while countries like Yemen and Syria are talking our leaders turn their heads away, or worse, are part of the crimes. This has been stated better than I could do by our preceding speakers. The humiliation of the other has become a common bestial behavior. The financial great leap backward in the clutches of a green financial dictatorship has become the policy of the West, ineluctably leading, if enforced, due to the lack of physical economic developments, leading ineluctably to a policy which polite people call reduction of population and less polite people mass murders. More money has been issued in a few months in the United States than during two centuries of American history and Japan, Western Europe, Latin America are going in the same direction, giving money to the money managers and not to productive investment. As a result, the present and the expected potential economic production in the future are not of world population. It is not a technical mistake, but a willfully destructive policy of an oligarchy to maintain its power against the interest of the other. Such an evil behavior leads to war. We mentioned here that Joe Biden, the president of the United States, dared to call the president of Russia a killer. 
To that, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, deputy chairman of the Russian Security Council, answered, I can only quote Freud, nothing in life is more expensive than illness and stupidity. At the same time, the United States announced their commitment to deploy mini nukes, lowering the nuclear war threshold. NATO deploys in Defender 2021 military exercises next to the Russian borders. And Jill Stoltenberg, NATO's general secretary, calls for a global NATO extended into Asia, while the British government pursues the aggressive dream of a global Britain. Western policies are even worse towards China, as we all know. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, and the entire Biden administration are openly calling for joint preparations for military confrontation with China. From all projects mentioned, and I want only to mention, because Elga de Plarouche mentioned these projects from the American administration, I want only to mention the present interim national security strategic guidance. Uh, all these are the same background of warmongering, a warmongering tone prevails with or over some hypocritical references of democracy or the responsibility to protect. We, of course, say no to all these threats. The dissolution of NATO to put all these imperial threats to an end has become mandatory. A circle of reflection of French interarms composed of major retired generals has called to stop the mad train of NATO before it's too late. But of course, much more is needed. We need a positive project that would create a reference for the whole world. El Gazep Larouche calls for this, full for this full mission. The immediate establishment of a modern healthcare system in every country of the world. The doubling of world agricultural production in order to eliminate hunger and poverty for a growing world population. The end of the casino economy through a global glass steagle to separate the banks. A new Bretton Woods credit system to provide productive credit for investments in the real economy. The creation of 1.5 billion new productive jobs to rebuild the world economy after the pandemic and to seriously begin to overcome the anti-developing policies that are established. Cooperating with Russia and China to develop a new Silk Road in Southwest Asia and Africa. Good cause of the refugees crisis while establishing a lasting peace order. To fight for peace is not enough, we have to establish an order for the coming peace in the world. I made similar proposal from our country in France. Too often I hear people saying the conditions are not met. It's too good to be true. And even I think that human beings are not as good as you think. This is a moral decay of populations in our Western world. Faced with the permanent lying of the leaders, they have the belief in the good. It is to tackle this cultural pessimism that I make this call of action. Our fourth panel will show, will show the commitment of doctors, farmers, and persons engaged on the first front for human life to present their proofs that the good could and should be actualized and that a better world is possible, as was repeated by many speakers presently. Based, a better world based on moral commitment and all the potential means of production and transportation to build platforms for human development. The three ongoing Mars ventures express this cultural optimism necessary to all of us to build a world of explorers, a world of explorers beyond us both physically, mentally, and I would say in a real sense, spiritually. I strongly advise those of you 
who have not yet read it, to read Lyndon LaRouche's Earth's Next 50 Years, and those who have already read it, to reread it. But now, with impen- of your commitment to become more confident about your own powers. The battle for the future is not like a person or a lesson to be learned and followed, but a call for creation within our minds and for action on behalf of justice. Let me remind you of Plato's first book of the Republic, where he leads Glaucon, uh, Polymachus and Trasimachus to explore what justice is. He shows them that justice is neither to submit to public opinion and expect to trade advantages or to serve one's friends and harm one's enemies. It's neither that, nor to seek the advantage of the strongest, Trasimachus. Socrates stresses the love of honor and money is considered as a shameful thing, and rightly so. And he adds that power is a necessary task not to find one's own advantage, but the advantage of the governed, and mostly of the weakest among them. This is what we have to mobilize ourselves for. The difficulty starts when we look at the state of affairs today. Western powers dividing the world into two categories, friends and enemies, with no sense of the common good, infecting public opinions with that sense and dividing to conquer as a principle to control populations. This leads logically to the world of the Trasimachus and the Alcibiades, rule by force and war of fall against all. Our call to action is therefore a call to change the very way of thinking of our fellow citizens and to act to make it not only possible, but the funniest thing to do, because to do the good is fun. To organize each other, we have therefore to be ruthless, fun and ruthlessness, because we do expect the best from each of us. And it is with such a commitment that Gandhi won the independence of India and Martin Luther King, the end of segregation. The test of victory, not for the individual pleasure to win, but for the sake of mankind's victory, victory is therefore not only possible, but it is necessary. Going as an objective imposed upon ourselves, going much further than Gandhi and Martin went, not to imitate them, in this and that, but to fulfill their dreams. Let's have many dreams come true and sound the drum of history. But this time, as what was said in the first panel, with the best of all possible musics to reach a harmony of interests along a world land bridge. To escape from Plato's cave and discover the sun is not the end of our task, it is only the beginning. As Carolina Dominguez stressed yesterday, our the prisoners. The future belongs to the Leonoras, young Argentinians and Mexicans, young from Iraq and Yemen, young Americans, French, German and Italian young people, young Americans, Chinese and Russians, all of us young to meet a challenge. I wanted to say that today, the World Day of Poetry, poetry, which means hope to be shared by all. Great, thank you very much. Now, uh, if we could have everybody on, is that possible, who's available for questions, which may inspire people to send in more questions, although we do have quite a few already. 
so I see, see Senator, Black, Senator Black, Dr. Abash, Dr. Abash Hussein, Asghari, Hussein Asghari, Jacques Shaminad, Jacques Shaminad and, we and we are joined now, now by, by Helgut Zeplarouche. Zepp 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 and do we and have others, we have Mr. Others? Ramey? So we're getting the rest on. What I would like to do actually is ask Helga Zepp LaRouche, the founder of the Schiller Institute and the convener of this conference, if she has some thoughts and comments that she would like to express now. Yes, um, I want to express my gratitude to all the speakers who I think portrayed a very important picture about this region of the world, which you know, I wish very, very much would again have the glory it had during the time when Baghdad was the most <clears throat> developed city in the world, the Abbasid <clears throat> dynasty period. And I think we are on a good way of accomplishing that. But, you know, I want to thank especially uh, Senator Black and Ambassador Rambeau because you know what you said is so urgent to be heard and i think what you told the whole world and hopefully we get the message out to as many countries and and people as possible is not known it it, it may be known among certain circles and people in the region but if you ask people in the united states or in in western europe they have never heard and we got several message messages to this conference, they have never heard a live voice out of Syria or out of Yemen. And, you know, I think, you know, I want to really thank you because it was mentioned several times that, you know, crimes are being committed, which remind us of what happened to be set as the standard in the Nuremberg trials. And, you know, I think one could add a lot of things. I think the under development, the denial of the right to development for every single human being on this planet fits the same category because it is as murderous as, you know, if you kill people in, in any other way. So I really want to thank you and we make a, a holy commitment, a solemn commitment to get this message out as widely as possible with the idea to change this policy and replace it with one where all the neighbors of the Southwest Asian region are working together to undo this incredible injustice which has occurred with the new Silk Road. And, you know, I call on all the people in Europe to join Russia, China, India, Egypt, all countries should join hands and help in this development project and then it can be done. So I also want to back up what Jack said, we need a call to action and a big mobilization. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like, because I know the internet is a little bit tricky in Syria, and I'm not sure if we'll be able to keep Dr. Arbash on for all the questions. So Dr. Arbash, if you have something you'd like to say, please go ahead. I'm not hearing you. Are you muted? There we go. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You heard me? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. No, I don't have any question, but I believe that everything is clear. And the caliber of the speakers and their world uh, goes start uh, trying to the goal of your conference in french i am uh, je suis ravi okay i think is that it did i it's hard to tell here with the connection so if there's more or questions for you we'll try again, but thank you very much. What I would like to do now is go to the first question, uh, which I think um, could be answered by both Hussein Asghari and Mr. Ramey. 
It comes from Mr. Saeed Mujtaba Ahmadi, who is the Deputy Chief of Mission from the Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan in Canada. And he writes, number one, how could the United States develop a new post-pandemic strategy in coordination with the South and Central Asian countries to support political and economic stability and prosperity in this region? Helga may have some things to say about that also. And number two, what would be the role of major infrastructure projects to improve connectivity, foster socioeconomic development, and economic cooperation among the regional countries? So perhaps, Hussein, do you want to go first? I can start, but I think uh, Mr. Ramai has uh, more to say. I, uh, what, concerning what the United States and other Western powers can do in the region is the, actually, we don't need to reinvent uh, the region or the mechanism. There is already a mechanism uh, which is evolving. More and more nations are joining it, and it's the Belt and Road Initiative. Most countries around, including Afghanistan, uh, almost every country in that region, except for India, they have joined the Belt and Road Initiative. It's working, as Mr. Ramai explained for you, uh, about what's going on in Pakistan itself. So what is needed is that the United States and the EU join China, whether by joining the BRI formally or not, that there is already a, a, a method of work which is accepted by all nations as equals and join that system without this supremacy complex and admit that their policy was incorrect, as we have heard today, it has been destructive and that the people in these regions really don't hate the West. I mean, people are not, they, they, are, they don't envy your economic and social system where 1% of the people uh, enrich and empower themselves on the expense of the others. They are not envious of your system. They want you to contribute with technology, with know-how to improve their lives and work with them as equals. And I think China has been doing this. That should be the model to be pursued. Mr. Rame. Oh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. I think uh, there are uh, certain uh, initiatives already on which we can build, for example, the heart of Asia. So in a number of uh, European countries and the Western countries, including US is a part of these uh, negotiations and, uh, and uh, these uh, activities. And under heart of Asia, we have a special, uh, you can say the special windows for the economic cooperation and infrastructure building in Afghanistan. But if we specifically look toward China and the BR and CPEC, Pakistan has already extended its hand towards such uh, Afghanistan to be uh, Afghanistan should be the part of CPEC. Because look, if you look at the infrastructure Pakistan has built, especially from the Gwadar port, it can facilitate the trade with Afghanistan if we keep politics outside of it. Because it is the shortest route, one thing. Second thing, when Afghanistan people traveling through the Pakistan, they don't have any cultural differences with any, ever. for example, there are the number of the Pashtuns are living in Pakistan, especially in the border areas. If you talk about the newly merged districts, ex Fata, are you talked about the Chaman border, are you talk about the other parts of the Balochistan where the Pashtun belt, um, yeah, the Pashtuns are living. So this can be done. But most important would be if we keep politics out of it, one thing, and second thing, if we design program according to the need of Afghanistan, because if we look at Afghanistan statistics as I already have presented, that is really bad. If we include the ease of doing business indicators, they depict even more bad on a worse picture. So how we can bring Afghanistan into the CPAC and in other development initiatives, it depends how carefully we understand the dynamics of Afghanistan in the field of development and economy and institutions. It should not be like that, so we can say it's market competition. In the market competition, you need players who have some similar capabilities. Afghanistan does not have those capabilities due to 
the war going on for the last four decades, more than four decades. So whatever we have to decide, we need to decide with the prism of Afghanistan, not the, with the prism of any consultant or some other international institution, what they tell us. So these are farms are required, these are farms are required. Yes, they can do it, but immediately we have to take care of their own uh, stat status. What is their status? If we are just talking about the big thing, then doing nothing, then we can continue it and there would be no use. That's what Pakistan is doing right now. Pakistan is trying to offer them so what they need. Pakistan is not trying to tell them what they should do. Pakistan is trying to work with them what they need and trying to provide them. So I think that would be the major, major question if we want to build any meaningful cooperation with Afghanistan. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And I see we have Ambassador Rainbow. Very good. I'm glad you're able to join us uh, now. So uh, Helga, you may have something to say about this, but perhaps the next question uh, you and Ambassador Rainbow would like to answer. Um, someone writes uh, the question from a young Syrian on the American divide and conquer strategy against Russia and China. Uh, the person writes, a young Syrian questioner asked the Russian and Chinese uh, diplomats about the, quote, uh, Trump focus on war with China while pursuing peace with Russia, the Biden focus on peace with China and pursuing war with Russia, and then asked them to comment on the American policy of divide and conquer. The person writes, the policy of divide and conquer toward Russia and China is a British policy. It is consistent with Mackinder's geopolitics policy to prevent Asian development and circle the continent. O Biden, a complete instrument of Britain's BlackRock, neocons from both parties trained in British geopolitics and British cancel culture menticide, has deployed all US and intellig intelligence and warfare capabilities to apply pressure to China and Russia to break up all nations in the Middle East and destroy their economies through financial warfare and propaganda warfare, vaccine warfare, food warfare, etc. cetera. Uh, they say Colonel Black's speech as an, an old Marine warrior is greatly appreciated. Uh, however, without clarity indicating the British role in running the entire operation, uh, we are addressing the United States, which is certainly as guilty as hell, but what about the role of the British and how would we make that more clear? So, um, Helga, do you want to start and then Ambassador Imbo? Oh, you're muted. Oh. there. I'm... No, we can hear you. I'm sorry. It's just a delay. Go ahead. No, I want to give the ambassador the first round. Okay. Oh, yes. Ambassador? You are muted. Ambassador Rainbow, we cannot hear you. Also, I should just say if uh, the ambassador okay. is... Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. Uh, well, I don't know what uh, has technically happened, but anyway, there was, there was something wrong, you know, the connection. I think that uh, about... Uh, so I. I listened to the, half the answer, but not the answer completely. So that I don't know what exactly what the matter it was between China and Russia and the U.S. policies uh, uh, with these those two countries. Yes. But uh, what I can say is that uh, my purpose was to say that uh, finally, when we take into consideration the change at the White House between from President Trump to President Joe Biden. 
Yeah, nothing could be expected very, very important about uh, when the policy with the uh, with Middle East uh, countries or Near East countries or with the Arab and Muslim worlds at large. I think that uh, that there was well, quite uh, the, same, the same strategy was being expected. And I think that uh, it was confirmed by the first weeks of the Mr. Um, Biden mandate. About Russia and China, I think that the result, the global result is the same. I, um, I understood what we said about uh, when the priority of Donald Trump and the priority of Joe Biden, it was exactly that one for Russia and uh, number two for China and the other way around for Mr. Biden. So the, the objective research, Russia and China having the same attitude towards, for example, the Syrian conflict, uh, as it was said at the Security Council, uh, maybe a dozen of times, a double veto from the two countries. I think that we cannot expect any change if, uh, well, at first during uh, Donald Trump's mandate, uh, well, there was uh, some, uh, well, good, some better attitude toward Russia, but with China, it was the enemy number one. And uh, with Joe Biden, it's exactly the opposite, but the result is the same. I think that the, with these couple of countries, the tension will be very, will remain very high. And it will be, well, an aggressive uh, uh, diplomacy between the United States and Russia or between the United States and China, but the result will be the same. And as concerns the Middle East problem, and especially we are talking on the Syrian conflicts, it was the subject of my intervention, what happens, Syria was just a part of maybe at the center of the conflict, uh, not only in the Middle East and the Greek Middle East of George Bush, but it was the central and the epicenter, the center and the epicenter of the conflict between the Atlantic Empire, that's the Western camp, and the Russian, the bloc, uh, the uh, Russian, Russian, uh, Russian and Chinese bloc, I think. And that uh, globally, I to some extent, uh, a country like Syria that has been devastated, that has been uh, well uh, under sanctions, under blockade, and, uh, and so on, that was the victim of an aggression war in the first period for 10 years, and uh, that for the last uh, period is uh, well being uh, well uh, passing under the regime of sanction and under an invisible, silent, and endless war, as I was saying when my intervention was cut off. I think that uh, there is no change at the global region. The war will continue. We are entering, uh, well, uh, the, the 11th, the 11th, the um, uh, 11th year of the of the war, and uh, Syria is being devastated more and more. And uh, the, the Syrian people are uh, well uh, living a real uh, well tragedy, being angry and being not uh, well, healthcare is uh, not possible because of the sanction, because of the embargo. They are thirsty, they are hungry, they are sick, they are well uh, hurt by the pandemic of uh, the, the corona pandemics, and there is no solution, visible solution for the time being. And it, it seems that uh, in the global geopolitical prospect for the time being, Syria will continue to be the epicenter of the conflict between well, Russia and China on the one side and the United States and the Western country on the other side. I, am not, I don't know if I am wrong or right, but I think it is well in the close, the short run future, it will be the result, the situation of Syria. And about the details between China and Russia, or Russia and China, I, in the United States, uh, well, apart from the change of president in uh, Washington and the change of enemy number one, well, for the, the Donald Trump and for the Biden, I think that the result and the sanction for Syria will be exactly the same. And I think that the, the, the future of, uh, of Syria won't be finally traced by uh, the Western policy and the American policy. That is what I was wanting to say. I think that uh, the, the, the solution in Syria will be will depend 
on the balance of forces, the geopolitical balance of forces and the new geopolitical balance of forces between the Atlantic uh, bloc and, and the Eurasian bloc uh, for, for the time being. And I think that uh, where for the, the 10 years or a dozen of years, there have been a big change in this balance uh, in favor of uh, Russia and China and against the Western uh, and American countries, the, the Western countries' forces. I think that the advantage is not in the same camp as it were well, uh, the 10 years ago when the war uh, in Syria did uh, start. Uh, that's what I was wanting as the first remark. I don't, I'm not very sure that I was very clear, but uh, that was what I wanted to say. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. I'm sure Senator Black has some thoughts on this as well. Uh, but Helga, do you want to go ahead and then? That the question about the role of the British is extremely important because if you look at almost every conflict in the world right now, you find the footsteps and the fingerprints of the British. One must actually say that British intelligence is uh, remarkably good. In, in destruction, you know, if you think about what they did in India, the opium wars, which the Chinese, you know, really had to wake up hard when, you know, the Hong Kong uh, issue came up. Or look at, you know, any conflict, you know, involving the Skripal affair, which, you know, the Kui Bono, and it, this was, you know, the hands of the British, the Navalny affair, the effort to topple uh, Putin by, you know, sponsoring this fake uh, operation, you know, which uh, RT had this program showing that one of the campaign managers of Navalny spoke already several years ago with a British uh, diplomat who was an MI6 agent asking him for 10 or 20 million per year in order to organize street uh, demonstrations in Russia. I could make the list longer and longer. But I think the lesson, and there I, um, you know, politely disagree a little bit with the ambassador, that I think we cannot sit out the problem and wait until the balance of uh, <clears throat> the the power balance shifts in such a way that you know the the the, the ability of this British uh, destabilization becomes less because. You know, I think this is uh, for a variety of reasons has incredible dangers. I think we have to really educate the world population to end geopolitics. Geopolitics is what caused two world wars uh, for which the British, by the way, had the main responsibility. I mean, we made a whole documentation of how the British manipulation of the landscape uh, in the years between the ouster of Bismarck and the actual shots of uh, Sarajevo, uh, you can actually prove that this was a chess game manipulated by the British. Look at Sykes-Picot, look at the great game uh, of, you know, the, the whole idea of geopolitics from Mekinda, which then was taken over by Haushofer. I think we need to write a story, a history about geopolitics and why we have to overcome it. Well, how does it work? Every country has a conflict with some other country, a neighbor, or and there are historical, ethnical reasons because wars happened, injustices happened, and this is being played upon. You know, you can put your hands in the wound, you know, like between India and Pakistan, the Kashmir issue. I mean, all of these things are being manipulated, and this is why we have been saying from the very beginning that the new Silk Road as a concept of the world land bridge, which brings development to all, is the only way how you can overcome geopolitics. Because how do you overcome the conflict between Japan and China or South Korea and China? Well, if you have a total development for the whole Eurasian land uh, continent, including the Americas, including Africa, so that everybody has an advantage. But this needs to be put on the table as a totality. And, you know, I think the lesson out of the pandemic uh, and now the famine uh, is that we have to organize, and that's what the Schiller Institute really uh, wants to accomplish, that we put this idea of overcoming underdevelopment for everybody, for every nation uh, on the agenda. 
And then, you know, you can see that there would be an advantage even for, you know, <clears throat> the uh, United States, which the biggest problem obviously is the military industrial complex, but they could change, they could retool, they could produce some useful things. So I think we need to have a world mobilization to have a new world economic order and the blueprint for it is the word land bridge. That way you overcome geopolitics. And I think that that has to, you know, people have to understand that as long as they say, this country is my enemy because they did this. And then the other one says, yeah, but you did that. That was the lesson from the peace of Westphalia where they said, for the sake of peace, we have to stop this, you know, listing of crimes of the one side and the other side. And we should, should prove that Henry Kissinger was not only supporting this genocidal policy with his NSN uh, 200 document in 74, but he was also wrong when he said that the peace of Westphalia does not apply to <coughs> Southwest Asia. So we need to educate the population that geopolitics itself is the enemy and it's a British concoction and it put, should be put on the scrap heap of history for good. Thank you very much. And I will say as a New Yorker, uh, there's certainly a great deal that the United States could be spending money on, which would be very productive, like the infrastructure, which is disintegrating as we speak. Uh, Senator Black, do you have some thoughts about what's been raised so far? You, know, <clears throat> you mentioned infrastructure. It's amazing how many years we have spoken about infrastructure and uh, one administration after the other said, so we're, we're going to do some huge administrative, uh, some, some infrastructure project. And uh, we print money by bushels full and none of it has ever gone to infrastructure. So it seems to be uh, more of a red herring than anything. <clears throat> there, there's no doubt that the uh, that the U.S.-British uh, alliance is uh, very much the most powerful alliance on Earth. Um, the, we view the British in a much different light than we view our other uh, allies in Europe. Uh, we still have sort of an occupation mentality towards Germany uh, and towards the other countries of, of Europe. Um, the fact that uh, we are imposing sanctions on German companies for engaging in free and open trade with, with Russia by completing the, the uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline is sort of a, <clears throat> a graphic example of the, of the attitude that we have that, uh, that uh, Germany is really not out of the occupation stage. They really are subservient to us and uh, we should be able to punish them uh, just as you would a child. Uh, it's, it's a very, uh, very negative thing. You know, in talking about the Silk Road, uh, you, you draw back and you look at the, the American paradigm for foreign policy and in so many places, it follows a certain sequence, just as it did in uh, in Libya. Uh, and uh, the U.S. goes in; they they befriend the leader. Uh, then they covertly undermine the leadership. Eventually, they murder that leader. They destroy the nation, and they leave it in a smoking ruin. That is the American paradigm right now. If you look at the Chinese paradigm, they accept the existing government. They do not interfere unduly with it. Uh, they go in, they build infrastructure, they conduct trade. Uh, we're sometimes because uh, they they it's legitimate trade they don't uh, they don't expect to just make it a welfare program they expect to to benefit from the trade they engage in which is the only the only long-term solution it's got to be a two-way thing 
But I think more and more countries look and they say, what do we want? Do we want the American paradigm or do we want the Chinese paradigm? Well, I'd rather not have the Americans come in and, and, and uh, execute me and then bomb the country to oblivion. Maybe I'll go with the Chinese and have some airfields and roads and dams and bridges built instead. Um, I think the US has got to reject this paradigm it's very self-defeating. It, it not only damages other countries, but it damages the United States itself. Um, there is no evidence president, presently that suggests that the US and NATO wish to ever see peace in the Middle East. Uh, I believe that perpetual war is now viewed as a means of weakening weakening the Arab nations vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Saudi Arabia. And this is, this is what we intend to do. Uh, we, we have this covert alliance with terrorists, which, uh, which seems to have had its uh, genesis uh, when we were trying to oust the Soviet Union from Afghanistan. At that time, we had under arms a, a radical jihadist army of uh, 300,000 troops in the field under the direction and uh, being armed by the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, we eventually did drive the Soviet Union out, but in the process, <clears throat> we established a, uh, uh, a group of, uh, of madrasas where we uh, use Saudi Arabian imams to teach the most radical, bloodthirsty vision of Islam, not shared by other countries. And uh, later this gave rise to Al Qaeda, which uh, attacked the Twin Towers and the, the Pentagon. So it's a failed strategy. And I think the US role in the world is changing. And somehow subtly, you know, we can't just simply come out and say, well, we, we're, we're not uh, on top anymore. But I think we need to gradually begin to accommodate a uh, multipolar world. Uh, the American monetary uh, is it's still quite dominant. And, and it's, uh, there's not a radical change, but there is slowly a weakening of the American dominance, which is what allows us to print uh, money without any constraints. Uh, we're supporting a vastly bloated, corrupted, unsustainable military force. Uh, the, oddly enough here, we're always touting our, our free market values and how, how efficient they are. And yet I, I have no question that uh, the Russian defense industry is able to produce uh, fighter airplanes for vastly less than what we can. And, and I think they're on the verge of producing uh, more effective weapons than we are. Now, I'm not big on the whole weapons industry, but I'm just saying that it, we've, we have to reduce the size and the drain from this, because we're spending as much as as the 10 biggest military spenders behind us, including Russia, China, uh, Saudi Arabia, Germany, India, um, just a tremendous number of nations. And yet we have this huge force. Um, I think there's global discomfort over the US interference on the high seas. The fact that we have arrogated unto ourselves the, the entitlement of being able to uh, pull over ships uh, of other nations and, uh, and uh, confine their crews and the ships themselves and uh, do what we would like with them. Um, this type of thing used to be called piracy and now we have a different patina on it. But I think 
I think there are a lot of countries that are not particularly fond of the fact that we allow ourselves to do something that if another country did, it would be considered an act of war. Um, I think there is anger over the unilateral sanctions that are being imposed uh, both on friends and foes. Uh, we, uh, during the past 30 years, we have ramped up this uh, regime of sanctions to where it's become uh, almost out of control. It seems like anything that's introduced in, in Congress that has the name of sanctions will pass very quickly. Uh, people want to pound the table and they say, we're going to punish this one. No, we're going to punish that one. Um, are approximately 30 countries right now that have some sort of uh, export controls imposed on them. And uh, I think what we have done with Nord Stream 2 by sanctioning uh, companies that are servicing the completion of the last one or two percent of that pipeline, it's, it's an outrage. Uh, it, uh, it, it certainly belies the idea of, of any sort of, a, of a, an alliance of equals. And uh, I, I think there is this gradual recognition among nations that the U.S. global dominance is gradually coming to an end. And I think it's important for us, rather than simply uh, being intransigent <clears throat> and maintaining this dominance, this unipolar world at any, at any expense, I think it's appropriate for us to do as other mature nations have done and to say, okay, there are changes afoot. It's time to accommodate. We, we now are going to have to resort more to diplomacy and less to bullying in order to manage our affairs with other nations. Um, but I think, I think uh, what, what, I, what I'd very much like to see, now I, you know, I'm a military man, I believe in, in having a, a very strong military, but it doesn't need to be nearly what it is. Uh, we we need to have a, uh, a a high quality and strong military, but at the same time, I think we could cut back on the size and the number of weapons considerably. I don't think there should be any trouble in in cutting a quarter out of the defense budget, uh, so long as we don't take it out of personnel. We have a tendency to always say, "Look, we've got to have." you know, a zillion F-35 fighters. Well, we don't need that. We need to we need to pay our troops adequately. We need to have them well disciplined and so forth for the protection of the United States and not for the projection of aggressive military power overseas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I know uh, you have a tight schedule, so you may or may not be with us as we get to the end of this, but uh, yeah. stay on. I'll, well. I'll have to check out uh, fairly shortly, okay. but I'll stay on. Just a okay, little. good. Now, I know Mr. Ramey wants to say something, Hussein Asghari also, and I have another question for Jacques and, and the ambassador, but uh, Mr. Ramey, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for giving the opportunity again. So I have two quick observations. Number one, can we use or to build some mechanisms to counter industrial military complex, which has been expanded in the past? No, it's, you can say it's a industrial military, as uh, John uh, Bright, Senator John Bright said, it's academia. He also included academia, but no, it's, uh, we can include think tank and the media. Because actually it's an industrial military complex and it's arms which are creating the problem. With, as a nation, if you talk about the people from the US or the Western country, they, 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 I think they can vice with us. They can tell us that we don't want to kill the people, but there is something is wrong with that complex. Can we build some mechanisms or we can 
counter the influence of that complex so we can bring back the normality. Number two, on economic security, I think we have to bring back the economy from the security. If we are too much obsessed with the world of the security, maybe we have to redefine the secure economic security. The security should be based on the well-being and the welfare, not the militarization of the economy. What we are doing at this point of time, at the name of economic security, we are bringing in the military and the militarization of economy. Maybe if we can work on these two things, this is my thinking, maybe we, we can do build some good uh, mechanisms to counter this existing influence. Thank you. Good, thank you. That's a good idea. Hussein? Yeah, I uh, really want to uh, thank uh, uh, Senator uh, Black for what he said, but while he was speaking, I started receiving messages from some Iraqi friends saying that this is the kind of American we want to have as a partner. So uh, maybe you should become an ambassador of goodwill for the United States to repair the damage which has been caused. But there are funny ironies in the way the US military functions. Um, uh, last year, in relationship to China specifically, because last year the uh, Joint Chiefs uh, Chairman, Mark Milley, was in a hearing in the US Congress. I don't know, I don't think many people noticed that. But he was asked, how much are we dependent? Our military forces are dependent on China when it comes to medicines. And he said, I, I quote, he said, you rightly pointed out that it is a vulnerability to have a country such as China manufacturing high percentage. I don't know if it is 97%, 98% or 80%, whatever it is, but I do know it is a high percentage of the ingredients to the American pharmaceutical industry across the country, both military and civilian. So most of the medicines, antibiotics, vaccines that American soldiers use around the world in their bases is produced by China. Now, after this hearing, did the United States say, well, we have to shift this and start producing our medicines? No, because the ideology is a free trade ideology, which says if it comes cheaper from China, let's buy it from China. So there is something wrong with the American way of fixing the economy. Now, I have a friend in Iraq, uh, he said he had some job to do fixing electric stuff in an American base, okay? Iraqis don't really, I mean, when they meet Americans as individuals, they like them, that they have no problem with American citizens. But he said, if you go to the supermarket in a US base in Iraq, the supermarket is full with Chinese goods. So <laughs> I think Americans should think, think a little bit about this issue and you know try to fix their economy mr larouche has been fighting for this for a minute it's not like it's anti-chinese to build your economy or infrastructure and produce your own medicines that's the natural thing a sane people would do but at the same time they can work with other nations like people in iraq iraqis the reason iraqis have survived not only the last few decades these thousands of years of wars is because they are willing to forgive and forget. Maybe they will not forget everything that has happened to them, but they are willing to forgive if on condition they are provided with a future. The reason the Iraqis survive is that they are always thinking that tomorrow will be better. We will have a solution to these crises. Our children will have a better life than we do. And it, it's in that sense that if we have our mind in the future, then we will be able to think in it much more clear uh, with dealing with the problems we have today. So I thank you, Senator Richard Blackett. You really made a great contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And I appreciate actually what you said, uh, Hussein, about I think this is a cultural question, which we started to get at in the first panel yesterday, because I'm sort of amazed by the speakers we've had from Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and others, that they have this quality of optimism where we in the United States, and perhaps Western Europe as well, who have not nearly suffered the same hardship, are much more pessimistic about the ability to change the future. And I think that's something we should really think about. Um, now, this is a question, uh, for Jacques and um, 
you may have other things you want to say as well since you haven't spoken much thus far, but the question asks, has any European nation now distanced itself from the comments of, Fre of President Biden, his attack on the president of the Russian Federation, Putin, as a killer? Is there any word from any European government distancing itself from this remark? I don't hear you. Yes, there we go. it is a very, it is a very, very important question that you asked. And I will take it in a certain more uh, in-depth way, if it, because I think it's very important to understand that. It's a difference between an empire and a republic. Uh, if you look at what an empire is, and this is part of all the things we have discussed. An empire has no constitution. It has no principle. It has rules based on habit and based on conservation of things. So this creates in a population, naturally a pessimism because there is no creation. By principle, there is no creation. And the expertise in an empire is not based on searching the truth, but on establishing the causes logically of an ex already existing universe. So you rule over an empire by dividing people. Internationally, it's geopolitics, as Elga mentioned. Inside the empire, you divide according to religions, to origins or whatever, and you create a sort of cancel culture of the war against, of all against all, uh, based on, on things that would prevent a sense of a common good. And then it goes even inside the minds of people. And there I reach the former republics in Europe who have still an imperial way of thinking. So the lack of opposition comes from this imperial way of thinking where you have in the minds of people this division between science and art, action and, and uh, uh, let's say, in, in action and so on and so forth. In, in such a, 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 a mind, uh, you have a difference, and François Mitron, once a French president, said it bluntly, a difference between what you think, in what you say, and in what you do. So you have a divided self. So it's not only divided to rule as geopolitics, divided to rule within groups inside the nation, it's divided to rule within a mind. So then you have a lack of opposition, and you see, typically, the French president, Macron, would say at the same time, at the same time. So this at the same time means that you don't take a forceful action. This is what I call, uh, I, 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 I stress that a call of action is very important because these people in the European world thinking are based on still an imperial behavior who leads them not to intervene or to intervene on the side of the criminals. Um, this is what happens. That's the first thing to say. Then the Republic. The Republic is made of citizens. And as Elga said, yes, it's an individual citizen that makes and develops the Republic. This is based with the idea of freedom as in inscribed in the American Constitution. So this freedom is not only to not harm the other, that's you are still there with enemies and uh, friends. Uh, it's not even to do to the other all the good that you would like the other to do to do, is to unleash in the other all the creative potentials. And this is the basis of agape. So this you don't have. And this is in Europe, with all of us that are in Europe, our work to create that and to recreate that. So there is a semblance of opposition to the Biden administration at a certain level, but absolutely nothing substantial comes out of it, comes out of it, because there is this impotence of the divided self. So I think it's very important to understand when you look at Western Europe, because as Diane said before, uh, you look at Ibero-America, you look at Africa, you look at the Middle East, and you have people that are much more forceful because they don't fear a conflict. They don't fear a conflict. Have been 
uh, if they are intellectually committed, they have been morally committed to the other, to the advantage of the other, they have been raised to take a conflict not with anger, but with hope. And this is why I mentioned the importance of poetry, because poetry in that sense is to explore the unknown, as we have to explore this unknown to uh, uh, organize a much better world. And this is the base of our commitment in the Syrian Institute. And I think this, this is exactly something that European leaders, Western leaders, but European leaders in particular, fail to understand because they are ruled by an imperial bureaucracy, which is called the European Union. And this is what it has become. It's the, it has not the appearance of it, but the reality of it is that. So we have to free ourselves inside our minds, inside our institutions, and inside of our own countries of this imperial weight that we still have. And I think this is key for us to understand what freedom and what uh, happiness means. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Helga, did you have something you wanted to say at this point? Well, I have a little project which I want to get, um, you know, I, want to, I don't know if that's the right moment now Tell us the little project. I think then what I will do, there's a few questions. We're getting very good questions, and I'm going to read maybe three of them, and everybody can answer what they want, and we can conclude. But maybe you should say what you have now. Uh, I, I, uh, I, you know, I, I, I believe since a very long time that the key strategic conflict which has to be solved is the one between the United States and China. If these two countries can be, you know, one to work together, then I think that all the conflicts can be solved. If they don't work together, I think we are heading for a catastrophe. Now, I, a couple of weeks ago, decided to launch a little uh, initiative, like a call, or uh, an appeal to China experts from all over the world, uh, people who know China either from their own experience because they worked there or lived there or had business there and they should sign a little appeal and I would like to read it and if uh, you could put it please up uh, put it up on the screen uh, it's very short a declaration of China experts from all over the world for some time an international anti-China campaign has escalated where think tanks mainstream media and strategic reports of all sorts paint a picture of China and its alleged intention, which simply is not true and is extremely dangerous. An enemy image is being projected that in the worst case, case leads to war. We, the signers, all have direct experience with China, be it that we have lived or worked there or from repeated travel over longer periods of time, could thus follow how Chinese society has transformed itself in an unprecedented way since the trauma of the Cultural Revolution. Thanks to a policy focused on the welfare of the population by the state leadership of the People's Republic and an extraordinary hard work of the Chinese people, 850 million people could be freed from poverty with the result that the population is fundamentally more optimistic about the future than the West where poverty is increasing as a consequence of the neoliberal policies. Trust in the government is substantially greater than uh, by us, a trend illustrated and strengthened by the effective way China brought under control the COVID-19 pandemic. China is a 5,000-year-old culture nation leading until the 17th century in technology, and it is thus not surprising that China today with a population of 1.4 billion people strives for an equal place on the world stage. China's socialism with its own characteristics for, a uh, for China is strongly shaped by the two and, two and a half thousand year old Confucian tradition, the orientation of its modern founder Sun Yat-sen on Abraham Lincoln, and even so the Chinese hold high the tradition of Karl Marx, their current economic system is more influenced by the American system of Alexander Hamilton and Friedrich List, the most famous non-Chinese economist in China. China learns from the best. 
China has a rich culture of philosophy, poetry, painting, architecture, and wonderful folk music. President Xi Jinping emphasizes the importance of aesthetical education above all for the youth as a precondition for the, the development of a beautiful soul, an idea promoted first by the first education minister of the First Republic in China, Tsai Yuan Pai, Yuan Pei, uh, which furthermore originates from Friedrich Schiller and Wilhelm von Humboldt. The success from China emphasis on science and technological progress and innovation demonstrates the China, that China is doing well with what the West is seemingly forgotten. And we would do better to respond to the offer of cooperation than seeking confrontation. We should take uh, better take up the view of the great philosopher and founder of modern mathematics, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, and in the dialogue of cultures find a way to solve the crisis challenging all of humanity. Now that call has already been, been signed by about 30 to 40 influential, important experts from all over the world. And I would appeal to you, the participants and viewers of this conference, that you help me to uh, spread that. Because I think if people from every single country would express that, you know, I think we could counter the anti-China uh, propaganda. So I'm sorry that I'm using my my position here to to launch this initiative, but I think it's it's really important. And while I don't want to distract from the absolute necessity to address the plight of the people in Yemen and Syria and you know solve the problem of the whole region, I think if we counter this anti-China campaign internationally, we have. Uh, made a major step forward in also solving the problem of Southwest Asia. So I would ask all of you, sign it, spread it, help to, to make it really a powerful avalanche of uh, statements. Great. Thank you very much. And I think this also will be available on SchillerInstitute.com. And for people who want to join the Schiller Institute and contribute, you can find it there. So let me just... Um, tell you these last couple of uh, questions and then people can make their concluding remarks. Uh, one is, and Senator Black may want to address this, do you view NATO as is sometimes alleged as an armored organization arm of the EU or is the EU a means to an end, i.e. rather an economic NATO, as was stated by Hillary Clinton, they say at Al. Uh, secondly, on the hybrid eternal warfare of the self-declared empire for decades against Iran and North Korea, 2001 against terrorism, uh, then against Russia, then against China. In the meantime, even against what they call the fellow passengers of the empire too. This conflict is often inconsiderately named, quote, an existential power struggle for the US, unquote. The person asks, isn't it rather uh, recognizable that this permanent warfare is fought exclusively in the interests of the financially powerful, the big central banks and some bureaucrats while flagrantly using the power of as well as the disunity of the U.S. citizenry? And that also is related to the final question I wanted to um, include with this group. Uh, Someone writes, is the United States being induced to destroy itself uh, that the current policies of the United States seem to be diametrically opposed to the policies of 75 years ago? That is when we were under Franklin Roosevelt and allied with China and Russia, defeating fascism and Europe. And who would benefit from the United States changing its identity in this way. Uh, so people may either respond to these questions or uh, say whatever you think you want us to know in conclusion. Hussein, I'm going to go to Senator Black because I know he has to leave and then uh, to you. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Um, let, me, let me just touch on NATO for a minute. Uh, it's ironic that uh, 
NATO, which was originally and genuinely established as a defensive alliance uh, against the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, uh, has evolved to where it is now one of the uh, greatest threats to world peace. Um, the NATO has moved, and despite despite a, a, a solemn promise to the Soviet Union that we would not move one inch to the east, we have moved a thousand uh, a thousand miles to the to the virtual border of Russia, and we're now th flying uh, mission missions of uh, of nuclear capable bombers uh, where they where they charge up towards the border and only at the last instant do they peel off uh, forcing uh, the Russians to alert all of their forces and prepare to a uh, defensive maneuver uh, it's extremely reckless it is extremely dangerous and we have people in NATO who are willing to risk a nuclear war. And uh, it's become quite, quite dangerous. Um, now, uh, who benefits from all of this? Yeah, there's, there's no doubt that uh, there are global bankers. Uh, I always think of the boys from Davos, uh, the globalists, the, the international oligarchs who, who really have no uh, national allegiance to any any people. Uh, their their goal is is an allegiance to the one world order, and uh, uh, it is true that they benefit tremendously from disunity. And I think that uh, some of the things happening in the United States today, uh, with the we have we have. Uh, a division of troops defending the capital against the American people, and meanwhile, no troops defending the southern border, which has virtually collapsed. Uh, and I think I think there is a plan to basically reduce nations, and particularly the United States, to groups of squabbling, bickering. Uh, individuals and, and nationalities and religions and so forth, to where the people can never be a countervailing force against evil, and I think that is uh, I think that is not accidental, um, and I think it does lead towards uh, the ultimate self destruction of uh, of the United States. And I suspect that similar things are happening to the nations of the European Union, where all of the defenses of the individual countries making up the EU have been abolished by the bureaucracy in Brussels. And the people have no voice in their government uh, any more than you know, today the, the people of the United States have have very little confidence in our elections any longer, uh, very little ability to influence our government in any way. Um, I, I want to go back to just one thing and then I'll conclude, but someone mentioned, uh, you know, what do we do with the military industrial complex, which is so vast and powerful? The only possibility that I see is under the current administration to set up a tension between funding increased military expenditures and the desire perhaps to actually carry out this infrastructure project. The only way that you you have any chance of diminishing the military industrial complex is to set it in competition with another political force. And the political force would be infrastructure and the, the building of roads, dams, bridges, highways, railways, this type of thing. Uh, 
I would like to see that attempted. I, I would like to see the Biden administration seriously consider uh, instead of instead of the continuing warfare in the Middle East and in Africa to draw back and to use those funds uh, for construction within the country. And I think I think there is some possibility of doing that. And who knows, there might be some way that we could uh, we could uh, make a proposal through the Schiller Institute to uh, to do something like that. But I just throw that out as a possibility unless there is a countervailing political force, the military industrial complex will continue to be utterly dominant in American foreign affairs. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me. I'm going to have to sign off now, but I very much appreciate the remarks of all of your, all of your guests here. Uh, they have certainly enlightened me and uh, uh, my prayers are always with the, the, the people of Yemen uh, that Saudi Arabia and, and the United States will eventually stop the, the utterly criminal war against the people of Yemen. And likewise, the, you know, we have, we have made war on Iraq for 30 years, uh, starting with the, the Gulf War in, in uh, 1990. Time to end it. This, we, we talk about the 30 years war in Europe. We've now fought the 30 years war in the Middle East and it's time for it to come to an end. We need to pull people out. We need the Iraqis to stand up an independent government without the heavy hand of the United States. So anyway, God bless all of you. Uh, my best wishes and uh, thank you very much, Helga, for putting this on. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, uh, Hussein Askari. Okay, I find it uh, challenging to say anything meaningful after what uh, Senator Richard Black just said. Uh, but I want just to uh, remind people of one thing and also conclude by that. Uh, it's, there was Lin Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, the late uh, Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, he produced, a, I'm talking about the endless wars, he produced a video in uh, 1999 I very clearly remember that day also. Uh, he, it's called Storm Over Asia, in which he warned that there might be a series of wars launched uh, along Eura the, you know, all over Eurasia. Uh, but he said that conventional wars will be obs has become obsolete. You can no longer win conventional wars. The only way you win a war today unfortunately, is by using nuclear power, the nuclear uh, uh, weapons. So uh, he not only is warning against that, so we can have demonstrations in the streets against these wars, but he at the same time developed an economic alternative to this, which we now call the new Silk Road, the Eurasian land bridge, but also for the reconstruction of the US ec economy itself. So therefore, uh, rather than uh, using a lot of our energy and time trying to figure out who is behind the wars. And I mean, it's important, uh, everything. But we need to equally think about learning about economics, as Mr. LaRouche has uh, taught us and try to get it to the people, but also educate other people, especially young people, but even people in, in power. Uh, because one good thing about human beings is they, they can change. Nobody will be evil forever or stupid forever, they can improve and they can change. And therefore, it's very important that we learn these things uh, and be able to deliver it to others. I think one of the reasons that we have, not only by myself in Iraq, I, I mean, I know many Iraqis, uh, some of them we become became friends now. They are activists, but they are on social media, they are not in power. Uh, one of them is even called Karim Silk because he talks so much about the Silk Road, trying to educate people in Iraq about Silk Road. But what they appreciate most, those young people in Iraq and I and others talk to, is the optimism that is generated by understanding how real economics work, how to build a nation, 
how to sustain a development process. Where does wealth come from, which is the human mind? These things is, is giving an enormous injection of optimism to those people in Iraq. I talked to, and I'm sure it, the same applies to other places. Now, there are some young people who told, look, we should overthrow this government. They're working against the Silk Road. I said, look, we have, you stop this regime change nonsense. We cannot. You have to educate yourself. That's how you take power in your country. And I'm willing to help you understand these things, but also you can educate your politicians, your leaders and others in these things. And I think it's a very important, even for people in the United States, I was very happy to hear the discussions going on in Ibero America in yesterday's, that all this education going on, because that would be extremely important for the American people to shift this terrible destructive culture at the same applies to Europe, I think. So I think I, that's what I would like to conclude with. Great. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rainbow. Thank you. And I'm glad you are with us. And I'd like to apologize again for the uh, problems that erupted during your prepared speech. Thank you very much. No, don't, don't, uh, don't worry. Uh, just a few remarks, uh, two remarks and before ending my intervention. I think that uh, I do agree about what was said about the necessity and the basic necessity to recreate, uh, uh, to reorganize a better world, much better world order. Of course, it is true, but I think that we can not, we can, we cannot do that and realize this, uh, reach this goal without uh, creating a new international law. Because the problem. If you happen to listen, for example, if you happen to listen to the, the meeting of the Security Council of the United Nations, and when you hear the, the delegates of the Western countries on the one side, on the one hand, and uh, for example, the Russian delegates on the Russian or the Chinese ambassador on the other side, you have no common viewpoint, you have no common background. I think we have the impression that those five uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations don't live in the same world. They don't speak about the same thing. The speech is quite different, not only in the contents, but about the basis. There is no international law any, anymore. For me, it is obvious. And we need to recreate an international law because we cannot continue and create a, a consensus between well, the big powers in the world uh, even taking into account the new political balance, geopolitical balance in the world uh, without creating this new order. That was existing at the time of the Cold War. I am not nostalgic of the uh, Cold War, but uh, I think that there was some kind of balance and some uh, kind of common understandings uh, to avoid war. For the time being, we cannot. And I think that the, the first big things uh, are the countries, the Arab countries, domestic countries, for example, uh, as uh, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, or I don't know what, Saudi Arabia, other, other countries in the, in the region, and for, for example, that are the victims of this uh, tension, permanent tension without, uh, well, the two blocks that I have mentioned. I think that geopolitical balance is very, very important, but the new political order in the world does need to create or to recreate a, a new international law, because we have no, when we say, for, we, we know that uh, President uh, Biden, for example, accused uh, President Putin to be a killer, to be a murderer, or to be a criminal uh, head of state, uh, I think that it was not possible when there was an international law, because international law is not only law, but it's a kind of language, but it's political language, the customs, uh, the, uh, the, the behaviors, uh, and uh, I should say, the courtesy, the protocol, what is what can be said and what cannot be said. And I think as far as we have not recreated this uh, common understanding between the nations, there will be no peace in the world. No military solution, but a, a, a political solution. Up to the diplomats to create a new political world, not to the military and to the armies, because the tension <laughs> will be permanent. For the time being, it is not possible because there is no common understanding. This is the reason why I rely, I think, that the, the geopolitics is not a uh, well, kind of entertainment uh, for intellectuals. It's a reality because it's just the, the, the policies of geography, it did, of course, the policies of the country, 
is duly related to their position, graphical position on, in, on Earth. You have not the same policies you have in the United States that is very far from the theater, for example, from the Middle East, that have not uh, suffered uh, well the, the, the world wars of even the warfare in its lands. Um, but uh, I think that uh, for, for, for the European countries, they should be more uh, well uh, attentive to this, to this problem. But in fact, uh, for ideological reasons, I think that the Western countries, the Western European countries are very well close to the United States from by, uh, they are linked together by uh, ideological links and they cannot well get far very much from the US positions. And they, uh, well, I think that on, in this uh, situation, there will be no political solution, for example, for Syria. Syria, the, the, the Syrian people here, for example, for the Iraqi, I, I was noticing in that, in that period that for Iraq, uh, what, a period of 30 years was needed in order to recognize the, what happened in Iraq, the number of victims, the tragedy, for the state that was destroyed, for the people of Iraq, for the children of Iraq. We needed 30 years to understand and to recognize openly what happened, that it was a criminal operation and the kind of plan well, to destroy Iraq. Do, will we need 30 years to recognize what is happening for the time being in Syria, destroying the country and the state, destroying the, the people of Syria, well, this crime, this aggression, this criminal aggression, international aggression, the crime, crime par excellence, well, will we need 30 years to recognize when there is no Syria anymore? I think this is the problem. And we, I say that about Syria and Iraq, but I should say that about Yemen, about all the Arab and Muslim countries in the region, and maybe other states, uh, all the drama, the tragedies in the world. So we need a new national international order, but a new international law. International law is not just a dec um, decoration, it's a, a necessity for a new, much better new world. Great. I apologize for the being uh, too long in my uh, speech. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will go to Mr. Rame. Thank you, General Father, this opportunity again. First of all, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Helga for organize, not only organizing this important uh, uh, event and my friend Hassan who invited me here, but also to Ms. Helga. She mentioned about the Kashmir. I think Kashmir is a big tragedy nobody is talking about right now. The 80 million, 80 million people has been um, confined in their homes. So that is a huge, uh, there is a huge human rights violation is going on. So maybe we need, as Ambassador was talking about, 30 years to recognize the problem. So that would be a problematic. Again, no, I will end by talking a little bit more about, I already have spoke about economic security. That is very important area to break the complex. Because this is an area where they play with the common people. They say your economy is in danger. So we have to do something militarily. To control something so they try they use it to frighten the people rather than to do something for their people they try to blame other people like what was going on in france on the west yellow uh, yellow west movement what was output the media ignored it at a larger extent they just tried to keep it low at the lower level so again they were blaming it to some other body so cpac which is China Pakistan Economic Corridor, again, the hostage, you can say the victim of this logic of economic security. It has been presented to the different countries. Look, if the CPAC will be completed, your economic security will be at the state. That is not the case. Actually, CPAC is an opportunity to connect. It is an opportunity to help Pakistan, which is ally of war for the last four decades, we sacrificed for the, this uh, alliance for the last four decades. Even after the war on terror, we lost uh, some, more than 70,000 people. We also, uh, you can say, bear the loss of $120 billion to our economy. 
but still if something is happening you are criticizing it at the name of economic security of your own self defined parameters the cpac is also an opportunity for afghanistan as i presented already afghanistan is really need in the help of, in the help of economic help which can create economic opportunities not aid because there are the 30 million people there you cannot give the aid to the 30 million people you need economic opportunity that's why i was talking about uh, afghanistan dina integration rehabilitation project economic project so we need to talk about that for that purpose to break the nexus or to weaken the nexus we have to bring back economies from the jaws of the security of the military we have to bring back it to the welfare and the well being as china did look at the china in the last four decades they brought out more than 70 50 million people 750 million people out of poverty because their economic security was defined on the basis of well being and the welfare of people not on the economic security was defined on the on the military terminology so this is a stark difference and think that is the same reason industrial military complex is against the china because the china is not providing them the same opportunities which they can have the opportunity from other parts of the world so i will conclude here we have to bring back economic security from the jaws of military and the security domain we have to refocus economic security in the term of welfare and the well-being of people thank you so much Thank you. Thanks for your participation. So we will go to Jacques Cheminade and then to Helga. Jacques, I have to say some people were rather provoked by your discussion of the division of the self, division of the mind. So I don't know if you're planning to say anything about that, but if you are, uh, you'll, it'll be appreciated. Well, um, our problem and our enemy is a British thing in an Anglo-American form, which is an occupation force, including against the British people, Uh-oh, we're having... Okay, go oh. ahead, Jacques. Try again, and we may have to... Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. And our enemy is, uh, of course, the financial British Empire, which has mutated into an Anglo-American form. And this is an occupying force against all, and, and also against the British people, and mainly the American people. So we have to free ourselves, and that would, in our action, would solve the problem of the division of our mind. We have to be clear of what we are doing, not with anger or resentment, but with the joy of bringing something to our populations. The second point is that the European Union <clears throat> has become the one branch of this empire and it acts as such with a global Green Deal, the new Green Deal, which is against the very conception of populations. It's criminal in its intent. Then NATO is a military branch of this system, of this imperial system. And it's remember that it's, NATO was a cradle for the Club of Rome. There are limits to growth. To what Lyndon LaRouche opposed, there are no limits to growth. And he said how to proceed to make it F work. So at this point, this being said, uh, it has to be understood that China is a key part of the solution. And the Elgas Declaration is key, including for Southwest Asia, because to give justice to China is to give justice by the same token to the Middle East and what Hussein brought and what was uh, <clears throat> uh, developed by our uh, uh, speakers from that region. It's now very clear. So what happens for us Western countries? Our countries should change because we are part of the problem. So the solution is to uproot the evil planted in us by this empire notion. 
And remember, uh, the punishment was for us, was the punishment of the empires, was in World War I, what was the British Empire mainly, as Elga said, but remember, France was also an empire, Germany was empire, there was the Ottoman Empire, and all these empires created the condition of war. So this should be remembered, and then it's, if you are a Republican, your mind is no more divided because you are a citizen committed to the universal good, to the common good. And this is inscribed in the American Constitution, and this is a way to, as was stressed by uh, Alejandro Yaya or uh, Daniel uh, Marmolejo, and in particular uh, Carolina Dominguez, it's to create a youth movement where <clears throat> this freedom, this liberation of the, uh, I must say, this heavy weight of the empire, we are freed, and then our mind is straight. And uh, that's a challenge. And the challenge, I mean, I am optimistic that <clears throat> we are going to advance very fast because the uh, moment of history is tragic. And in these moments, there is a chance to change things. And uh, together we can change it. And I am all already uh, seeing the resonance of what we are doing in our diverse countries and we should keep going. And uh, I think uh, there is a sense of poetic hope for the future because we are ready to explore the unknown, which is a commitment to do better than those who inspired us from the past and to bring to Lyndon LaRouche uh, the gift that he deserves. Great. Thank you very much. So now we will go to Helga and let her uh, conclude this panel. I want to address the question if the United States and the European Union are self-destructive. And I think they are much more so than people really realize, because right now, they want to commit 30 to $50 trillion into green investment. <clears throat> now, that is the biggest self-destructive policy because, you know, you cannot go to low energy density in highly advanced industrial countries without destroying them. <clears throat> now, this will come at a huge social cost because, you know, the uh, one of the economists of Deutsche Bank recently wrote that the whole debate about the Green Deal has been completely dishonest because the EU, for example, did not tell the people that this will go along with a gigantic, dramatic reduction in the living standard and, you know, will destroy many, many jobs. And I think there is now a first important reaction, which was mentioned yesterday, that 12 attorney generals from 12 American states are suing against executive orders of Biden uh, trying to implement that. Now, I think one should really consider the fact that in the interim national security review, where on the one side the geopolitical confrontation with Russia and China is uh, dominant, the other major issue is that climate change is the national security priority number one of the military industrial complex. I think this is this deserves to be much more reflected upon because I think this is the crux. What has the climate change question to do with the fight against Russia and China? I I I can I cannot now elaborate this in all consequences. I just want to put it as food for thought for people to really reflect that point because I think what uh, Senator Black said is true. We have been trying to do that for many years. But if we could mobilize that the same investment of 30 to $50 trillion would go into infrastructure in the United States to reconstruct Southwest Asia, you know, we would solve the problem. You could, you could have a peace solution. You could have a solution which would be in the interest of everybody. And it is clearly the alternative 
to the building up this war machine and going to war. But to do that would really require a gigantic mobilization of the populations of many countries working together. And this is one of the things we want to accomplish with this conference. Great, thank you very much. So I just have a few, I'd like to thank all of the speakers, those who are with us still and those who had to leave. Uh, a few announcements. One, there are two releases from uh, Helga Zepp LaRouche. One entitled, Why LaRouche PAC No Longer Represents the Policies of Lyndon LaRouche on the Schiller Institute website. The other is the letter which she just read and promoted in her earlier comments, the declaration from experts on China on the urgent necessity of U.S.-China cooperation. And uh, Helga, what you just said really leads us into the next panel, which will begin at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 11 a.m. on the West Coast, and 7 p.m. Central European Time. The challenge of famine and pandemics, coincidence of opposites, or mass extinction. So we hope to see all of you back in about 31 minutes for the next panel. Thank you very much.